Good evening, everybody, and welcome back to the Aviation RC New Podcast. My name is Joe. And I'm Matt. And today we're doing something a little different. Well, very different. You can see us if you're watching in a video platform. Otherwise, you're just listening to us. Uh, this is episode 87. We're going to be talking about aerodynamic lift. You, you love Excellent. love and showing off that mug. <laughs> I love this mug. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. It's one of my favorites. But yeah, no, we're here to talk about aerodynamic lift. We're going to do our best with it like we have in all the other, I'll call it past difficult topics. And we chose to go the video format because we realized their visual aids, the, the visual aids that come with the discussion are very hard to describe mm-hmm. in a meaningful way. And really, this is where the picture is worth, you know, a thousand words. Hopefully. And even then, if we did a thousand words, we probably still would get it a little off. Yeah. Um, so we're opting for video. So if you are listening to it in the podcast, we're going to do our best to be able to, to describe the kind of image we're going to show. But we're going to urge you to go to our YouTube channel, um, Aviation RC Noob on YouTube. And uh, we'll have this video available. And we're going to start actually... This is going to kind of kick off the the format, I guess, for turning our audio into video. Yeah. Part of what we delayed about was trying to figure out how the heck, what's the best kind of way to bring that out, um, rather than just have a logo bounce around. Um, each one of these episodes has a handful of pictures for the histories or some of the other items. Um, <clears throat> having an occasional picture would really be nice. So... Uh, I think as we move things over, we're going to put together, basically use the outline we've already created for the episode to create a small, short presentation or an effective presentation to go with it. And that'll be the background of the YouTube. So if you haven't heard the, you've heard the episode that we've done before, go listen to it again on YouTube and see some of the visuals that we had with it. Once we maybe eventually get those put in a video format. Oh, that, I, I think that will come around pretty quickly. Okay. Well, <laughs> yep. feel free to uh, <clears throat> give your opinions on how you think this turned out. And yeah, please. we'll see how it goes. Okay. For those who may be joining us on YouTube uh, and seeing us for the first time, hi, nice to meet you. Uh, we've been hi. doing this a little bit. Uh, we're going to go through our normal uh, flow of the show. We're going to talk about some things we've been doing. Uh, what, what we've been doing in a hobby and otherwise, and then we'll talk about some community stuff, and then we'll get into the main topic. We don't have a history segment this time that I know of, do we, Matt? Uh, no, I thought about pulling one together, and then I realized, let's just focus on this new thing um, for this week, and when this format comes up, we'll keep it, we'll have the same format, and we'll just make another presentation like this with vi- with uh, visuals. Mm-hmm for that whatever segment needs it. Um, <clears throat> yeah. But but for this one, let's just keep it as simple as we reasonably can. Okay. Well, uh, without further ado then, uh, let's start, I guess, by thanking uh, all of our listeners. You guys have shown up to watch this, and uh, always important are our patrons who continue to help keep the lights on and help to keep... Uh, Matt and I able to do these things and have fun with it without having to worry about, uh, you know, hosting it, fees and all that. Yeah. So, so thank you very much. Yep. And if you're interested, feel free to head on over to patreon.com slash aviation RC noob. And if you got some pocket change you want to throw our way to help, uh, further these efforts, feel free to do so. No obligation. Of course. Uh, Matt, what have you been up to in the last, hmm, how many weeks? Um, well, I've been kind of furthering, uh, further developing the, um, we've talked about in some of the past episodes, we've, you and I have been going to Flight Fest together as a podcast and as friends for the last, what is that, three years now running? Yeah, this was the last, uh, this last one was three for me. Okay, right. And <clears throat> we've been, uh, we make it an endeavor to involve our community as well as kind of inspire others. Uh, last year, we have the uh, RC Noob Wonder 
um, which is in the background here. I've got actually two different versions of it, a micro and a regular. Um, and we made a giant one. So this coming year is the 10th anniversary. Um, and we've talked about different things we want to do. And uh, we're still working on officially uh, what we're aiming to do. But I wanted to pull out an idea and kind of test it out and see how good it is or how bad it is, right? Should I punt and do something that's a little bit more tried and true, like making a 300% um, sea duck or something along those lines, like a plane that's already, you know, well-known, right? Mm -hmm. Or do we go with this uh, new thing, right? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen real quick here. Um, and using Onshape, they're not a sponsor, um, I was able to create a handful of airfoils and, and whatnot to kind of give an idea as to what we're aiming for here. Oh, if you're sharing, um, so, if you're sharing so it your is screen, a, that's going to be a thing. Oh, okay. That's okay. Um, I don't know if you can look at it in Discord and kind of show it or not. Uh, okay. I'll, try anyway, to, I'll try to swing think, it over. Think of it like a half a teardrop uh, bottom on a lifting body, long, long flat plane lifting body. Uh, landing surface that's maybe what is that uh, 40 inches by um, 60 inches maybe a little bit more uh, seven inches and then two eight foot wings uh, eight foot wingspan wings uh, 90 inches it's about eight feet right um, <clears throat> a little under eight feet but anyway have two tandem wings um, one acts like a car the other one does the, the heavy lifting and then in it will, and this is part of why I want to build it so bad, I want to see what kind of issues we should focus on as we kind of develop this. Um, but I want to have a disc shooter on it, which basically launches parasite fighters uh, to defend it, maybe? I don't know what you want to call that. But So I've got a couple of ideas that I'm going to test. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to build this platform um, to possibly test those ideas. So... Uh, I've been getting to work and building that. You can see some of it in the background, although I don't know how much you can really see of it right now. I really can't see a whole lot. But. Yeah, I've got it locked onto your screen. Okay. Um, yeah, if you look uh, right here where my finger is pointing, it's a mid, mid uh, upper arm is the long airfoil. Yeah, you're... And it, it lasts like the whole, the whole width of that, that bench. Yeah, your your camera's tiny right now because I got this pulled up. That's okay. All right. Anyway, so I've been working on that. Um, I've got all the airfoil sections cut. I've got the spars. I just finished cutting them today, so I've got to glue them into position and cut the receiving slots for the, the wing profiles. And then once they're in, um, I'm going to cover them in like a docu-lamp and see how well, part of that is to see how well that does. And then the other half is to build this teardrop shape underneath. So, yeah, it's in progress. It's making headway. Um, I'm liking what I see so far. I might need to go out and get a bunch more glue unless I can find where I kept my stash somewhere. I see a bag here, but I'm, I know there's more. Um, so we'll see where that goes. But that's most of what I've been working on. Um, other than kind of thinking and working on upcoming year podcast stuff. Because we're getting to that time of year where we look forward to figure out what we want to keep doing. So, if you have ideas, we'd love to hear them. What about you, Joe? Okay. Sorry, I was also dealing with trying to get that pulled up. Um, mm -hmm. I'm trying to think when we last left off. It was before Thanksgiving. So, Thanksgiving, got to go out of state and go see the in-laws. Uh, spent, okay. spent some time with them and my father-in-law uh, has a 3d printer and apparently it really hasn't run since um, shortly after he got it so it's just been sitting down there not doing anything um, I was able to spend some time uh, working with that and get it printing again and the problem he was having was that uh, his prints kept knocking off essentially um, oh, okay. He'd set something to print, and then he'd come back and find a pile of noodle. Um, and yeah, so, sp spaghetti. <laughs> yeah. Struzan spaghetti. So, it, it's really disappointing if you've never experienced it. 
yeah, it's, yeah. It, it's pretty disappointing when you're like, all right, I can't wait to see the, oh. Yeah. <laughs> so what ended up happening there was, as best I can tell, um, his bed needed to be leveled, which you said that it was leveled last time he tried printing. But also, he's got a glass top or a glass mm-hmm. printing bed, and I think even though he had his bed set to a temperature, maybe it wasn't translating all the way through the glass uh, to be the right temperature. Anyway, I bumped his bed temperature up a bit uh, to right. he, 60. You said, yeah, you said he had it at 40. And and it was 50. Uh, okay, well, the, the common understood is 60 mm. I think, uh, nowadays. So well, it's good that you found that and, and turned it up to 60. How did it perform when you did that? Great. Didn't have a problem. Um, did some test prints. They worked out well, and then we uh, looked for some other things to print for him, and ended up printing some. Somebody had taken a uh, like a dragon head door knocker model, and then put a like coat hanger lip under it. Okay. So they they had mixed those two together, so that you had a dragon head with the door knocker hanging out mm-hmm. of its mouth, but then had a hook. Mm-hmm. To hang, can hang to it. hang something, yeah, and he's he like a coat. Just got a, a hot tub out in the back of his yard and a nice cover and all that ah, over it. So perfect for towels. Yes, that was exactly his thought. And so we got those printing. I could not find the tree support option. Oh, um, okay. And for for anyone who has to print something that has overhangs and needs support, trees are the way to go. Uh, yeah, generally speaking, they are. They seem to be effective. They do really well, and they break away very easily. Um, his, this thing had a lot of overhangs, and it did so by default. It just did these square, uh, back and forth grid yeah. type uh, supports, and we got it cleaned up. But it was a nightmare to clean them up. Uh, and then my brother in law showed up and he was able to locate the tree feature uh within cura because i couldn't find it and as i left we had started uh two more of the dragon heads and i checked in with him later after they had printed and he said yeah that like they printed great so much better on the cleanup so that was encouraging um, and then I got a glass bed ordered in for mine because after seeing how well his printed, I couldn't stand it. Um, <laughs> got mine ordered in <laughs> and started to have some success, arguably had success. Uh, but what I was trying to print was Monday nights. I do a D and D game and one of my guys is a necromancer wizard. And so I thought I'd try to print him Lord Voldemort's wand Um, which has like a bone handle Mm -hmm. and all. And the way this wand prints, uh, by default, uh, its model is standing up. So it's got a very little contact point at the bottom. That's asking for it to just pop off somewhere mid print. Yeah, that was the problem I was having. And so I kept adding more and more you know, supports and thickening up the supports, trying to give it. Because it would just, just... Did you... Go ahead. Did you think about rotating it like 30 degrees? I didn't. So it, it spans across the diagonal of the bed or whatever, and that way it's supported along its length. And I didn't want to because it's just the way it was supposed to be printed. Um, oh, okay. I got you. But after four, no, after like six different prints of it popping off the bed, uh, uh-huh. because it's literally... That's- the tangent yeah, of the right? bottom of the round handle is what's in oh, contact. Oh, that's and not it, enough. And, yeah. and I added trees all around and like increase yeah, or yeah. decrease the overhang angle so that they would really tie in. But I got mm, like eight inches tall or so, um, maybe yeah. not even that high. And just the that's, and that's pretty just good. The by drag the way. of the nozzle yeah. laying itself down and just tilted it off the pant. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, and oh. I did then rotate it 90 degrees. So it was printing completely sideways. Cause I was like, I'm tired of fighting this. Um, yep. and that's when it decided to clog itself again. <laughs> so I came back. Oh no. Yeah. So I had a clear, Just when you thought you were going ahead. Yeah. I'm back to the old problems, but uh, 
right. Um, I just got to clear that up, and then ideally it should but, be good. But print bed adherence is much better as an overall. Uh, Not on the wand piece. That one doesn't count. Well, cause... so my father-in-law had great, great bed experience, and that was part of what sold me on it, on the glass bed. Yeah. His stuff printed, and it was when it was done, you let the bed cool. You just mm-hmm. grab Pops the thing right and pop it off. Yep. Mine uh, has not been just popping off. And maybe mm. it's because I'm doing a raft printing. Um, so with the cool part about raft is if you've got um, uh, one of the putty knives or a flat cake knife or something like that, you you should be able to get up under the corner of that and really kind of pry it. Because it's a, because it's a raft, it's sturdier, and that shouldn't be like effectively glued to it. That should still come off it's, fairly easy. It's There's been effectively a glued lot of to it. it. Oh boy! Yeah, I, I've been having trouble mm. getting prints to come Did off. Did you? You didn't glue it, right? Like you didn't put glue down first. You just left it as nope. a glass. I, I took the glass. Mm. Now, granted, I'm not on the <clears throat> I'm not on the textured side of the glass. Um, right. No, I, 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 flip, I've used I flipped it over. Smooth and works fine. I cleaned it I with like alcohol it. before I went, but okay. it's it's just sticking too good. But what mm. I have found is I can crank that bed temperature on up, and with the raft, I, the wand, if it had printed, I could just pop it off. But the wand handle half print was just you know pop off and come out. So I cranked the bed temperature way up so that PLA gets soft, and then I can get a corner to lift, and then it just peels off. Okay, but I just it's not. Mm. It's not popping loose when the bed cools. <clears throat> right. I'm surprised because uh, mine does like your uh, your father-in-law says. So. Yeah. Interesting. I don't know. Um, Such is the nature of budding technology, right? Yes. Um, you get any flying in? No. I know I haven't. Right? No, I haven't. Um, yeah, I hadn't gone since last time we talked about anything. I want to. Um, I've got one plane that I can take flying. I've got a whole pile of them on the floor behind me that might, that can be seen. Uh, yep. but no, I hadn't been yet. Um, Aero Scout, uh, the motor is doing some weird kind of grindy noise. Mm-hmm. Um, not, so it makes a weird burp, 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 burp noise when, uh, it goes low power oh. When the battery voltage goes a certain amount. It's the, the controller in there makes the motor make the burt noise okay so but it's not it's a different noise it sounds like a bad bearing and so i need to take it i ordered a a new motor because the the whole plane is excellent otherwise so um i'm trying to get the thing out and i can't find out where the heck i put my uh, my hex drivers drive me crazy and they're in here somewhere i have a whole pile of all the drivers somewhere important see the problem was you cleaned and organized that room Oh, uh, it, and it's going to get worse before it gets better. So, but I mean, I'm happy now. I've got the second desk. Oh, that's the other thing I did. I'm sorry. I, I put this other desk together, this other bench, and I've got a. I'm going to set this up so that it's kind of in the middle, and I've got um, work, uh, work cutting mats across it, so I can lay down bigger pieces, mm-hmm. kind of like the plane in the back, and some of the other things I'm going to work on. Um, and then the other piece that I've been kind of working with is. Um, I realized why I don't – tires have driven me crazy forever. And part of it is when I'm trying to cut them out on an X-Acto blade, they they look like a kindergartner cut them out because you like kind of have to saw through. I'm using this anti-fatigue mat. That's I think it's half-inch anti-fatigue mat. What is it, EPA, I think? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, it's the stuff that LARPers use to make their armors and some of the other things. Um, it's used in a lot of other crafting uh, stuff, but – so, so this is great tire material. It's lightweight. It's very durable. It's rubbery. It's gray black, so it looks like a tire, and you can sand it to shape. So that's cool. But cutting these things out and having it not look like a kindergartner did it is not the easiest thing for me. I have yet to pull it off. But I saw on Harbor Freight they had this drill bit that had basically a parallel piece, like a bar that goes through the drill or around a collar in the in the drill bit. And then it has two little spade pointed spade bits. It's got flat edges. If you were to line them up next to each other, they would have flat edges towards the center where you cut the tire. Mm-hmm. And then it kind of goes out in an angle. 
one bit is on the one the far side of the the left side of the bit. The other one's on the right side, so they balance more or less. Um, ish. Yeah, and so ish. You know, it's not exact, but it's close enough to be able to do it high speed. If you got a drill press, it works great. Um, so I test my drill bit. Uh, my my drill press works good, and so I started giving experiments on cutting it. And I'll tell you what, if you go slow, you get a very clean cut, like a really clean cut, and I'm surprised. It's uh, beautiful. Uh, if you go and kind of pull pull the drill bit down and just press right into it and go, uh, it kind of chunks the foam up pretty good. So I urge slow and even. And then the hub, I set it up so the hub, uh, the center of that, is just a little bit smaller, like most of my, um, you know, wheels, that they're a little bit smaller than the hub. The hub is the Gatorade cap. And then I cut out a piece of foam. I think it's five... Four and seven eighths, or four and three quarters, somewhere in there, is the length of this foam, and it's uh, uh, three eighths inch wide. And I just kind of curl it up and push it in and turn it into that little groove, in this just inside the lip of the cap. When right. you pull it up, that's where the where the plastic of the bottle seats. So you basically put it in there, and you can glue it in, and then you put the other cap on top, and literally screw it together. And there's a dimple right at the center of these, so you drill a small hole the size of your your uh, landing wire, and then you can reinforce that because it's not the strongest. It's a pretty good size, good thickness plastic. But if you need to reinforce it, you can always use um, uh, the propeller. Okay. Um, so you, there's a bunch of extra propeller pieces, right? You buy a propeller. You need one to to set up right in the collet. He's talking about the uh, prop sizers for your sh motor shaft. That's it. There you go. But there's a bunch of different motor shaft sizes, and you don't need all of them. You only need the one. So you can use one of the other ones as the size of your landing wire and reinforce uh, these hubs so that way they actually transfer the load better. Hmm. And then, so you even have a, a far stronger. And so something like this, you literally just almost pressing on this foam over top of that hub, that Gatorade cap hub, and you can glue it. Um, you said you using you recommended foam foam tack would work great, um, hot glue works good, and then at that point you just put this on your tire and you are good to go. It looks like a wheel. Looks you like a wheel. Spray paint the center. <laughs> uh, you can spray paint the center black or some other, whatever. Um, I think when we did the um, the Kate, uh, we took aluminum foil tape. You can put aluminum foil uh, tape around it and then it looks like a silver hub like a chromed hub, which works perfect. And you don't have to spray paint anything. All right. So um, that's what that's another thing I kind of tested and worked on. It works really great. I'm going to try to put together a little um, set of pictures and a build article so you can give it a shot yourself or, or look at it as you try to do your own version. Um, I just know a lot of people have issues with landing gear like I have. You know, they don't have landing gear on a lot of their planes because it's, <laughs> it's a pain to put together. Uh, putting together a tire that looks halfway decent to match the good, you know, the really good job you did on a on a model you made it's not the easiest without having to purchase a you know uh, a commercially available dubro model or whatever right really so good um see so did you work on anything else mm, i mean this <laughs> this episode yeah yeah um, this this episode did take a little bit yeah, and we're going to do the best we can with it. Um, other than that... I think uh, we're going to do great. Uh, we'll see. Uh, <laughs> you'll you'll probably do great on your stuff. Um, other than... Well, I... Okay. So let's talk about it. Let's get, let's get into it. Let's... Uh, the, the main topic today, then... Well... Because uh, if we don't have much else to talk about... do Oh, wait, we have a build tonight, right? Yeah, we have build nights coming up. Let me grab the dates on those. Uh, uh, I, I got them right here. Okay, you go over it because that's me pulling it up. It's going to cover our cameras. Okay, uh, Wednesday, December twentieth at eight o'clock. Uh, it's big building big with me, with Matt, and I'm anticipating this will be shortly after the the when I bring my kids up to see their folks. It'll be the first day of me just kind of being me. Uh, so I'm going to be building my that big plan. I'm going to try to get that working. That's going to be okay? a Wednesday night. So, yeah, because the kids get out of school on nineteenth. On Tuesday, and then so Wednesday night, I'm going to be, you know, kind of twiddling my thumbs by myself and okay. enjoying it. 
Yep. Uh, me and the me and the dogs and the cat. Nice. Wait, the cat and the dogs the other way. But yeah. Yep. So you can join me, and we'll try to get this behemoth put together. Uh, it's going to be what eight foot wingspan and seven foot uh, landing plate, right? And hopefully, I'm going to get a couple of working la models to land it, land on it with. Maybe see see how hard that's going to be. So well, anyway, so working on that. Are you still? And then we have our. Are you still considering the Velcro idea that we discussed? Uh, it's there's a lot of ideas up in there. We got like four or five catchment ideas. Um, all the way from electromagnet, bungee lines <laughs> that kind of flip flip up from in the deck to flip up to be just like a, and a, a, to be almost like a table tennis net kind of line, almost like they have it in today's landing craft. Uh, and then, of course, there is, in fact, a, 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 like a table tennis net that they said is just sort of a catchment at the end. You just sort of put it up, and if people can land on the deck and slide into that, then they, they did it. Um, mm. so that's an idea. Uh, like I said, using electromagnets, uh, Velcro is one, uh, as well as kind of a, we'll call it a guidance funnel that might, uh, tip up. And we'll see. So first things first, build the thing, have fun testing it. Um, so I was hoping that before Christmas, if I can get the working, the model working and create the loitering system, I think we'll be in really good shape to be able to talk to people about it a little bit with a, with a more serious and solid manner of saying, we want to make this bigger. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, we want to make this stupid big. And if Help we, us make it stupid. If you and I ever link up, I can work on the Speedy B stuff. Okay, which, uh, which Speedy B stuff? I thought you had... Oh, uh, uh, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah the, I know what you mean. loitering now. mode. Sorry, Speedy B. I'm thinking like three different things. One is that the control board um speedy b is a manufacturer of a lot of drone parts uh, um but it is also what a lot of people call uh like the noob wonder the mini noob wonder but a double like a double powered uh super hyped up engine so it goes really fast oh uh, okay they call that a speedy b sometimes so um yeah okay so we have the 20th uh, and then we have um the friday december 29th which is just after the holiday uh, right after the holiday season, uh, at the end of that week, uh, at 8 o'clock, Joe and I are going to be doing our kind of end-of-year build-out, build-off. Um, and then I know next January, as I kind of get my things prepared for build jewelry in, Jan in February, we're going to have some dates in January. I don't know if it'll be the 12th or the 19th. I think that's going to have a lot to do with uh, any campouts that my sons might be involved in, so... Mm -hmm. um, but that's basically, yeah, the, the 12th and the 19th, which is Friday nights. Um, if you would like to request Saturday nights, drop us a line. Uh, enough people uh, tell us uh, that a certain Saturday is good, then we'll, we'll set it up, and at least one of us will be there while we all build together. <clears throat> but, yeah, those are the four nights we kind of have. Uh, I'm not really sure, like I said, the January one, if it's going to be the 12th or the 19th. I set up both dates. Um, you guys are welcome to pull, come together as a community and build together without us if we're not there. So just because we're not there doesn't mean you can't join in the fun and create it on your own. We'd love to see it when it happens. Yeah. All right. Well, let's, uh, I guess, go ahead and get into this proper. Okay. Uh, so, go ahead. No, I was going to ask you, Joe. So, what is our what is our <laughs> official topic title today? Aerodynamic lift. Um, All right. It is a. Uh, l let's just say people go to college to study this stuff. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll quickly... I would say like two caveats. Yeah, right. One is people go to PhD level college to get this, mm -hmm. and by get it, I mean fully understand it and even then there's that's why they're doing the phd topics right yeah <laughs> it's because it still has more room right oh yeah and we'll, we'll talk about some of the difficulties with that um mm -hmm. and we'll we're going to do the best we can on these explanations we are by no means uh injured it well we're by no means aero we're no nautic. aerodynamic yeah, yeah. we're not uh, aer aerodynamicists that, that, i shouldn't say we're not engineers we do have one um, yeah, sorry. Yeah, well, I took a <laughs> semester. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, so you were I, almost one for a minute. Almost. Um, so, yeah, uh, a couple quick definitions. Aerodynamic lift is the force that directly opposes the weight of an aircraft and holds it in the air. Uh, and what we're looking to do is to clear uh, some misconceptions and provide as right. accurate an explanation of lift as we can. Keyword right. on. Remember, this is not um, what this isn't. Um, it's not going to be a design guide on how to determine the lift of your aircraft. I mean, you, you can use it that way, but we're not. This is just trying to understand where lift comes from. Mm-hmm. Not, and we will go through how to come up with the equation, you know, how to figure it out. To an extent. But, to an extent. So getting on into it, uh, we're, t- we're talking about what is lift. Um, I think you may have a couple slides on that. We're going to talk yep. about some misconceptions about lift. Um, mm-hmm. We're going to talk about, uh, as once we get through all that, uh, the Novier Stokes, Novier Stokes equations, um, what those are about. And then we'll talk about putting it all together and then practical applications. And then at the very end, we did have some listener questions in our Discord. Uh, Mm -hmm. that came in so matt you've got some slides addressing those okay great yeah and as a second note um yeah if you haven't joined our discord we welcome you to join us um we'll put a link in the the description of the video and we always have it in the description the show notes for our uh podcast um come come join the community Uh, we're always talking about airplanes so mm-hmm. if you're like me and only have so many people to talk to about it and have already driven most of them crazy, there's a bunch of us over there in the Discord. We'd love to talk <laughs> more about aviation. I don't think any of us tire of it. So, No, you guys stay pretty going. What do you mean you guys? Like you're not part of it. Get out of here. Okay, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm coming to the group. It's okay. All right. Getting into it. Uh, let's see if I can get these slides to advance here. Thought that was supposed to do a thing. All right. It is supposed to do a thing. Are you in the presentation mode? I am in presentation mode. It didn't do the thing, but that's okay. Well, well that's going to be because that's where all the title is. Well, I'll give it one more try. Boop, boop. Oh, there it goes. What is left? You can, uh, oh, look at that. Even auto advance. Good job. Yeah, that was the whole point of it. That way we wouldn't have to worry about it. Sometimes I've got us covered. Right. And there's the rest of the Okay, so let's talk about le- what lift is. Right, We talked about the definition of it, and it's basically any group of forces on a body that opposes the gravita- uh, gravitational pull or other resistive forces. Like in a balloon, there's air resistance all around it. It resists the inertial moment or an inertial movement. Right. Um, on a plane, it's almost always almost completely uh, directly opposed to the gravity of the plane because the wind resistive forces are much smaller in comparison. Comparison but, to? Uh, yeah. To the overall weight of the plane, of the body itself. Oh, okay. And this versus surface area and all that kind of stuff. Now, I'm sure there'll be somebody going, that's not entirely true, and you're probably right. Um, but we just wanted to kind of give you an idea. And, of course, so we have this diagram of a balloon, and we have, you know, lift. We have wind pushing on it from one side. We have... We have air resistance on the other side of the balloon going horizontal. We have gravitational um, pull of the weight of the balloon as well as... Uh, what? Air resistance. Uh, air resistance, uh, right, because we talked about how it's all around. Um, and then, of course, we have um, gravity opposing that. And then there's the buoyancy forces are the lifting forces for the balloon, mm-hmm. which is the differential pressures inside and outside of the balloon that creates the buoyancy um for a plane it's the it's essentially it's a differential pressure for the most part and we'll talk more about what it goes into that lift but it's lift opposed to the weight of the plane and then what keeps the plane moving through the air which generates the list is the the propeller um pulling it forward and it's resisted by the air resistance on the wing and body of the plane that's it speeds through the air, and that's called drag. And propeller with propeller craft or jet engine uh, with 
Yeah. It, yeah uh, jet planes. Yep. Okay. So your lift equation, uh, and you've got it in here, L equals, what, one half rho? Yep. Times <clears throat> velocity squared uh, times the surface area of the wing uh, times your coefficient of lift. Exactly. Uh, this is... The size of everything is making this a little bit difficult for me. All right, hold on. Okay, yes, exactly. <laughs> you... So it's okay. Okay. So if you want to, the velocity is in feet per second in that equation because there's some kind of constant issues going on there um, to make sure that all the things keep canceling out, like uh, density is slugs per cubic feet. If your velocity is in miles per hour, that doesn't help you cancel anything out, so you got to have feet per second. <clears throat> but if you're in luck because... Uh, 1.47 times miles per hour gives you your feet per second. So that, that's a pretty easy... Oh, that's uh, nice. Yeah, it's a pretty easy conversion. And surface area of the wing you want to have in feet, right? Because if we're still, you know... Um, so when you're looking at your model planes, um, if you're going to use velocity in feet per second, otherwise you should do it in inches per second if you want to use square inches of plane area, right? So uh, and what's important here is keeping the units consistent, right? And then coefficient of list, lift, and it's like, oh, and that is the last item. And it's like, oh, that's easy. It's coefficient of lift. You just use it, right? Uh, the problem is, is, and for a given wing, for a given thing, you can do a pretty quick approximate, use something that's an average and be good. H however, the caveat is that's where the rabbit hole is. You know, all the other things are kind of known, right? You can determine those pretty solidly. Mm -hmm. The coefficient of lift is what we're probably going to focus on and how it comes about, how we determine that value is what we're going to keep talking about. So uh, in, the, in the long way, yes. Okay. Because all the things we talk about are Go what ends it. up yielding the coefficient of lift. Okay. Right? All those things that we are going to talk about are creating the experimental data that yields the coefficient of lift for a given wing. Okay. We'll, we'll talk about that later. Yeah, let's see what we can do about diving into that. Uh, we want to dispel some misconceptions about lift. So when folks talk about lift or think about lift, there's a few things that come to mind. They think of the equal transit theory, which uh, is a application application slash misapplication of the Bernoulli principle. We'll talk about um, the downward deflection equals lift, which is that wings deflect the air. And when we're looking at these, these are those two are specifically, you know, whether folks fall into the camp of, you know, uh, equal transit theory slash Bernoulli principle is the primary driver of lift or is the downward deflection of air the primary driver of lift. And then the third misconception mm -hmm. we'll dive into is whether or not an airfoil is required for lift because uh, at first thought, uh, it's assumed that an airfoil would be required. So right. let's talk about it. Um, equal transit theory is the, uh, th the thought, and it's often taught, I know it was how it was explained to me originally, that air when a wing moves through the air air separates at the leading edge of the wing and then meets back up at the trailing edge of the wing and the explanation would be then that air that separates is the same air that meets up at the back for no good reason that's the assumption that you, you could think of it as two particles that leave each other at the leading edge of the wing are assumed to have met up at the trailing edge of the wing. Um, right. And I, I think we talked about, because that doesn't, and it's funny because this diagram isn't, <laughs> isn't what people think it is, right? It, it's a, it looks like it's, I'll, I'll call it like a, a particle, particle gradient or something. Like this is where the particles are, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, along the wing, but it's not. It's basically saying is if you take a cross section, that's, that's the, that's the layer of, was it equal pressure or equal, equal velocity, I think. And then, and they have multiple spots along the wing. And so that's the gradient line of where they're all the same. 
And it has nothing to do with where particles are along the wing or where the pressure is exactly. So uh, I think a lot of what this comes about is they people see this, and this is a convenient way to describe visually what what you end up coming to when people ask a question. You say, hey, there's a pressure difference on the wing, and that's why there's lift. Okay, well, why is there a pressure difference? Well, because the air moves more faster over the top of the wing. Okay, well, why? Well, well you see that it has longer to go. Right. And, but, and that's, but why? <laughs> and that, that's where the misconception comes in. If you assume that the particles separate and then meet back up right. with a curved wing surface, the particles well, ha- going over the wing have to travel farther uh, than the particles under. Therefore, they accelerate and... Due to the, the Bernoulli's, speed is, which right. we'll talk about, that creates the lift. Which is um, kind of um, a misuse of the Bernoulli principle, right? And so it, it's like, again, when you, when you back it out from that, here's my statement, and then little Johnny in the front or whatever is going, but why is that? <laughs> and then every time there's an answer, the question, well, well, why? And then they pull up this and say, well, they just they meet up at the, at the back. They have to meet up. Mm-hmm. Because they're all one wave, as you can see. And they're like, oh, oh, okay. And then it's clear, because that makes, visually, it's easy to follow. Everything else is sort of conceptual, and it doesn't make sense. Yeah, and up until a certain point, or a, what, I don't remember the date of when the experiment was done. That were, I'll go ahead and flip to it. It's um, like 2003, I think. Like Up until then, they, we didn't really have in. They didn't, we didn't have, like, concrete. No, that doesn't happen. But right. what I've got here are pictures uh, that I've taken from a YouTube video. Um, we, we'll have the link down below. But it, it's the wind chamber experiment where uh, flash photography was used to capture puffs of smoke moving across an airfoil. Uh, yeah, I'm not even sure if it was, I think it was just a film. And then each frame is a certain amount of time across that that puff travels across the wing and the airflow okay. of I, the wing. I think it, that's what he did. Because I saw him do it live. Like, I saw the the experiment on his video, and it's it, it's kind of a, just a, a puff of smoke. And then it travels across the wing, and you can see okay. as he takes different frames of that video of it just traveling across the wing. That's what we have here in the next slide, mm. where the slides are showing. And, the, um, and the, it was Professor Holger Babinski, out of the mm-hmm, UK. From the, from the UK, yeah. Yeah. And like I said, he's got a video, and I think we have a, a link to the video as well. Go watch it. That whole thing explains lift very well. It explains where it comes from and why all the other stuff is wrong. <laughs> so do like, we... equal transit is, is wrong. It's just not the correct way that lift occurs. So do we cut the episode here and just send them over there no okay. keep listening you're gonna hear our <laughs> antics of trying to explain this nonsense no but go, go ahead and take it let's so takes let's look at this uh yeah let's look at the slide so let's look at the pictures here each of these still shots are showing the the puffs of smoke in different points along their path the the airfoil is difficult to see in this imagery until the, the smoke catches you know gets to it and catches the front edge or the leading edge of the wing and what it's showing uh, as that smoke approaches and then compresses uh, on mm. the leading edge and goes starts to go over the top of the leading edge um, and then along the wing is the the air over the wing. And I want to say over, but there's a caveat I'll get mm. to in a minute. The air going over the wing accelerates, but it accelerates to a point that it actually outruns the air under the airfoil and that traveling along the bottom of the wing right right. and so that that's what that experiment was demonstrating so the 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 aspect of lift that's coming out of equal transit is still correct but the thought of it of the air meeting up at the tail end at the same time is incorrect the air going over the top of the wing actually accelerates and outpaces the the air right. going under the airfoil. And that, that experiment um, is just a clear mm-hmm. uh, a, a clear example of it, that equal transit theory being false. 
And what it also results in is that there's actually more lift being generated than would be uh, if you just accepted equal transit. And the reason right. that I put the caveat earlier when I said over the airfoil is if the airfoil was deflected downward such that mm -hmm. the air going under the wing was the quote unquote under well, was the w air that was ex being accelerated, then that force would be in the opposite direction. It would be in the downward instead right. of up. Well, so, and we do have a slide on that in a little while. Oh, that's okay. One of the theories that people commonly, oh, well, this is why this happens, and the answer is uh, also not not really. Okay. <laughs> we'll be on the lookout for that when it comes up, and then you can mm -hmm. talk about it. So all this is tying into the Bernoulli principle uh, done by Daniel Bernoulli, a Swiss math mathematician and physicist. He was born in 1700, um, had a family of prominent uh, mathematicians. And in 1737, he published the hydrodynamica um where he laid out his concept of uh i think it's vis viva which later would be uh better known as the Bernoulli principle and that's simply uh stating that a fluid in motion will decrease in pressure uh, that is to say that as a per, as a fluid oh. accelerates or flows faster its pressure decreases Go ahead. along the flow line Along, okay, along the flow line. Mm -hmm. um, so looking at it, uh, you had a great, you, you had an interesting statement when it came to any sort of fluid mechanics. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. What goes in must come out in yep. some way, shape, or form. And what you're trying to do with all the formulas is figure out exactly how, whether it be a loss in elevation, which is turning potential energy into kinetic energy or losses from frictions that might happen along the, the sidewalls or the viscosity of the fluid itself, which is where you get the, um, so the potential energy is the height difference. You got the kinetic energy, which is that V is viscosity, right? And then P is the pressures and the pressures will, will fluctuate depending on what the other equations bring, right? And they have to be equal at, at any given point between mm -hmm. point one and point two, wherever you draw that line, if the, and, and then it essentially gets more or less simplified to the, there is a direct relationship between the area and the velocity. So if you ulti multiply the area times the velocity, which essentially is a, <clears throat> a loose amalgam of the pressure, the pressure in one has to be the same as pressure in two, is that you didn't decrease any pressure, right? But what you did do, or uh, not the P, what is it? Flow, I think, right? Fluid speed. That's what P is representing in that one. It's always confusing because there's like P, rho, and other things that look like P. Um, anyway, but basically, so if the area decreases, like in P2, location P2, I think that's what it's referring to. It's, it's, it's pressure one. energy is what it's looking at. <clears throat> that's P1, right. P2. But they're, but they're going to be, right? So if the area is decreased, then the velocity hit has to change inversely. So it has to increase to match, right, proportionally. So the A, v, A, A times V at spot one is going to be the same as A times V at spot two. So if the area decreases, the velocity increases, and vice versa. If you're coming out, if you had a P3 at the outfall of that, you could, you could do the cross-sectional area of P2, and then the velocity of the stream in those spots, and you can note that, uh, those two combined will be the same as uh, the product at P3, which would be the outfall. And then essentially P1 would be pretty close to P3 if the areas are identical. <clears throat> Somewhere in there you lost me. Um, I did. I'm glad to help. <laughs> uh, Appreciate that. Yeah. Let, so let, let's move into the, the equations of Bernoulli's principle. Um, yeah, you Just had a whole setup because you wanted to run through to see what what's going on there. Yeah, I did, and <clears throat> I didn't want to relive my fluids dynamic course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, well, going back, the the idea that when the area goes from larger to smaller, if flow like flow has to accelerate, it, does, it like pressure drops. That's still foreign to me. Like all the equations haven't made that make 
make sense to me. I know it happens, but it's still, and I, I understand it's conservation of energy. It still mm-hmm. just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But Bernoulli's principle, and for those listening, I'm going to try to uh, state this equation clearly. Uh, but you've got constant equals uh, constant equals p plus one half rho uh, v squared plus rho g h, which is uh, where p is your fluid pressure, rho is your fluid density, v is your fluid velocity, g is your acceleration due to gravity, and h is your height above a reference point. Um, and I wanted to be able to walk through this equation just to have an understanding of how the equation works. And if I see an equation that's like, here's, you know, how you can calculate lift or whatever, like I want to be able to plug the numbers in and solve it as best I can. Um, so I have some example equations. Uh, as we dive into this, you'll notice that the rho g h section of the equation has been removed and that's simply because uh, that part of the equation is dealing with elevation change and when we're looking at the the distance of a wing uh, from front to back you're not dealing with that much change so it doesn't apply that that part of the equation would apply if you were looking at water moving in a downward or upward direction. Go ahead, Matt. No. Um, I'm looking at uh, water piping systems, mm-hmm. <clears throat> which is where I use this. That's, right. You know, so that, that becomes really important when you're looking at, hey, I've got a water, I've got a reservoir at the top of town at elevation 100 feet above town, and I've got all these piping systems at different elevations. What's my pressure going to be at the bottom? Mm. I mean, that's the kind of thing that we have to look at as civil engineers, right? So this right. is where the height becomes critical and some of the other things drop away a little bit more. But it is, as you can see, um, you know, the velocity, that V is it's squared. So that's a exponential function. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're just going to take some numbers here. And the these are theoretic numbers or just numbers being plugged in that are about right uh for the purposes of trying to solve this um, you were trying to you were trying to see if there is in fact a pressure difference over the on and the top side of the wing versus the bottom correct i was and i wanted to be able okay. to see what like what this equation was saying okay um, very good Go so looking at it again we're dropping off the rho gh uh for the altitude comparison uh, you then get your, we're going to end up solving for constant to be, for the constant to begin with. And the reason for that, so we can solve for the pressure later. But we need to get our constant. In this case, we're going to use an ambient pressure of uh, 101,325 pascals, which I believe is uh, atmospheric pressure at sea level. Uh, we're going to use a row of 1.225 kilogram per meter square, which is atmos- uh, atmospheric density at mm-hmm. sea level. And then our uh, V ambient or velocity ambient is, say, the uh, velocity of the wing moving through the air at roughly sea level. So we can plug those numbers in, uh, as you see here. And again, that's going to be constant equals 101,325 plus one half times 1.225 times 110 squared. And I'm going to try not to just rattle off those numbers as we go. You'll get a constant of 108,736.25. We can then use that to uh, begin solving under over equations for the airfoil. So you plug your constant in on the constant side of the equation. Then we can look at the uh, uh, P or pressure over under the airfoil um, along with the velocity over under the airfoil. We plug those numbers in and then you can rearrange the equation to get P over. We'll, we'll, We'll talk P over first, but 
you can move P over to the left side of the equation and solve for P over. Using those numbers, in this case, our velocity over the wing is 120. So we'll use 120 squared, and you get 99,916.25 Pascal. Um, then when you plug uh, numbers in for the underside of the wing and say that the velocity under the wing is 100 meters, um, did I say 100? So you, yeah, 100. You had a speed differential of 20 meters per second. Yeah, meters per second. <clears throat> So your ambient was 110, uh, velocity over the wing was 120, velocity under the wing being 100, and your pre uh, pressure under the wing being 102.61.1.25. Then you can see a comparison between your pressure under and over the wing. And you do have a positive pressure under the wing, a, a comparatively negative pressure over the wing, so you get a upward lifting force on the well, wing. you have a you have a lower pressure right. on the on the top side of the wing, and then that differential is that's what, a better way that, of saying it, yeah. And that that differential in pressure is what's causing the lift force. Mm -hmm. so anytime you have a, yeah, anytime you have a difference, that's what's it, the one is going to move so that they're equal, right? Of, effectively. So what what ends up happening is that air underneath creates a lifting force on the wing to equalize the pressure. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and as you continue to move through the air, it can't really do that, so it continues to lift you. Now, mind you, that particular run-through of it was kind of looking at the airfoil as a whole, which mm -hmm. if you were really working on trying to calculate uh, numbers, you would, you would take points along the upper edge of the, the, the upper side of the wing and along the bottom side of the wing and calculate at those points to give you a overarching picture of the right. forces over and under the wing so that you can add those up at, to give you a better each, lift idea. Like at each cross-sectional point on the top and bottom of the wing, you essentially do this thing. And then, and that's actually kind of what we'll get into later, right? Um, a little but bit, you can yeah. see this pressure... This is a, effectively a pressure gradient um, for a given airfoil. And mm -hmm. if you add up all these vectors, which are basically magnitude and direction, you add them all up, they create a net vector. And that actually is what direction you're, that's the force exerted on this airfoil at its center of gravity. Mm -hmm. Sorry, center of lift. Right. That's a big difference. <laughs> and it's an important difference. It is, because we end up saying, get your CG right. Um, and it, it it's true. It is your but CG. But ultimately, but... in this case, it creates the lift vector at the center of lift for this airfoil. Mm -hmm. So, uh, moving on to it's our okay. next one, because we'll, we'll return to a bit of that. Uh, right. You're, the so, next, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, this is that, uh, that's why I said we we're going to come back to it, because one of the other misconceptions is that, the wing is slightly angled, and there's air that hits it and it bounces off of that, and it's the equal and opposite force. So it, there must be enough air bouncing off going directly downward that creates enough opposing the, the, you know, the weight of the airplane, and then it stays aloft, right? And that's not entirely wrong, but it's not entirely right either. Right? It doesn't deflect 90 degrees down. It just doesn't. No, right? and... But so, the air does change direction, and that change in direction, you know, that's what actually is the deflection. Right, which you'll get into the Coanda effect later that deals mm -hmm. with that. But <clears throat> there, there is, so your downward deflection, air coming on, hitting the bottom of the wing, and the wing's changing the direction of that air. Newton's what, third law? Equal yep, opposite. Third yeah. law motion. You, you yep. get a upward pressure on the wing and a downward deflection of the air. Right. Um, yep. The air moves down. It has to move. Try to move the wing up in an equal and opposite way. So. And yep. while that does happen, uh, that's not that is not the sole contribution to lift. Nor is Brunelli's mm -hmm. the the sole contribution. 
Uh, right, and that diagram is the wrong way to think about the deflected air. That's not what's happening. You know, it's not deflecting like a pool cue. Are you talking? And I think that talking about this air, this one. Yeah, and that's what we're talking about when we're looking at misconceptions. When people think of airplanes flying through, they think that's what's happening, and that's not what's happening. Okay. It, it, to, it, it's similar, but that's that's the incorrect way to think about it. So and we'll to, we'll talk about how to think to about clarify that. on this one. I was drawing this graphic in PowerPoint, and I only had a ninety degree arrow that I could, <laughs> that I could quickly and easily use. So, well, uh, but that's why but it is. Yeah, but everybody, but that's what a lot of people think, right? Uh, maybe. I mean, I never really thought about it as a straight ninety degree deflection. Even still, it's close. Um, some people might, but I, I don't know. Anyway. But that's not, what we're trying to get at is that's not the way to think about how lift is happening on the wing that way. Mm -hmm. It's a little different. So let's, yeah, take a look at the next slide, I think, has a better. Yeah, so right. what this one's doing, and this was about the best I could find in to try to illustrate this. This graphic, uh, for those listening, shows basically a plank airfoil, uh, a flat airfoil that is slightly. Uh, up on its angle of attack, and you're still getting some compression of the air uh, at the leading edge and over the top of the airfoil. Mm -hmm. So even a flat wing will generate the, uh, the Bernoulli effect, but also it's not a huge deflection of the air coming off of it. It, okay. it increases as you increase your angle of attack, but again... The, the downward deflection is not the biggest attribute. Um, so let, let's talk about another piece. Uh, this is a good graphic to talk about the Bernoulli equation. A lot of people, when they say, well, you keep talking about how there's a Bernoulli equation, right? Like the area has to decrease, but there's no boundary on the top. There's no decrease, right? What do it you can mean? just keep deflecting, right? This airfoil shape, this deflection of the air over the wing, Right. Oh, there's no boundary on the top. And really, the boundary, the top boundary layer of the Bernoulli effect is where the airfoil, the air is undisturbed. It all goes in the same straight line the air stream was going to go before your plane ran into it. Those ones, that's the upper boundary of the, the air affected by the Bernoulli equation. Okay. Right? All the stuff in between the top of the wing and that line that just keeps going straight as it goes over the wing, that's the upper edge of the Bernoulli. That is your throat. And in that, in at, that Bernoulli equation. At subsonic, that range is actually quite large. Like the right. the air that's being displaced or, or modified, if you will, uh, extends a fair ways from the airfoil. I don't have a good graphic for it. Um, no, but it right. But yeah, but that's but that's where a lot of people say like, well, it doesn't take an effect because it's it's there's no upper boundary. It it can't. You're not compressing anything. It's just shifting the direction of it. There's no compression, right? So why would the air go faster? And the answer is, it is going. That area okay, I see is shallower. The upper barrier right? now. The out, the area is decreased at the at the top part of the wing compared to the front or the aft, and so therefore the the velocity does increase as it goes over top of the wing because it's it's a smaller area compared to before or after the wing. Okay. Yeah, I see, okay. What, you're, I see what you're getting at now. Yeah, and it's it's just, I, we didn't talk about it, but this is a really good example of kind of why. Because you can see the top line doesn't really bend much, mm -hmm. if at all. So that's almost straight. So I would, I would call maybe the third third line down or second line down from the top of that would be the boundary layer. On this wing. I mean, that's not entirely accurate, but it's, it's pretty close. Hmm. Anyway, sorry. Okay. And then the last misconception I've got for us uh, is that an airfoil being required for lift. Um, mm -hmm. And that's an easy assumption to have, um, especially when, we talk, when you're looking at airplanes, you see them have proper airfoils, but... Really, anything that can deflect, anything that can deflect the air or alter it, the airflow is going to be able to generate lift. 
you stick your hand out the window while you're driving down the highway, do like we do when we were kids, put your palm out, have it mm-hmm. level, and then tilt it up a bit, and you're going to feel that upward pressure. Uh, that upward pressure. Now, a lot of that is your, um, a lot of that is the deflection where the wind is beating on your hand, but also you are generating uh, the Bernoulli effect over the top of your hand even with your hand mm-hmm. acting as a plank. And that's why high alpha flyers can still fly. So if we think like, what, the nut ball? Yep, absolutely. What was that head smack about? No, the nut ball is like the quintessential uh, high alpha flyer where you're just kind of hanging it almost on the prop. Well, well like, yeah, at that point it's just <laughs> hanging. Uh, but, but that's some of the best, that's uh, some of the best combat fodder you could find. <laughs> So a uh, nut ball or the, um, and, w- and we're talking flight test plans with some of these, uh, the FT Delta, which was mm-hmm. that, I mean, technically that was what, a K K F K V M K F M K F M Fogelman. Okay. That, mm-hmm. that's still technically an airfoil because yep. it's a stepped airfoil staircase kind of effect, which right. deals with, uh, what? turbulent turbulence uh at the stepping layer or at the step point that allows the air to, the air going over the wing to maintain its laminar flow is that how that works uh, yeah more more or less uh i think there's a this is where the phd um topic part comes into <laughs> play like i i think what's happening officially is very complex but it, there is basically a vortices that uh, the viscosity of air kind of causes it to stick kind of to the, to the, as the air moves over the wing, it creates a void, which then s- sucks, right? It sucks the air back in underneath behind the step. And that circulation of vortices as the air is trying to, the air flow is generating a, a void or a vortex, a low pressure. And then as it comes down and back in, it actually creates this kind of oval pocket that almost completes the rest of the airfoil. Um, and so the air fo- flowing over that step continues across the top of the vortices that's generated and meets at the back of the wing almost as if there was no step there at all. Um, depending on how the airflow is set and the angle of attack, that vortices, that actual airflow may be as smooth almost as... Um, as a general, like a normal airfoil, um, or it could actually start to fail and cause turbulence near the back end of the wing. But basically, you have a far smoother airfoil or airflow than you'd expect. Mm. And the the diagrams on our slides show basically that pocket of low pressure. And that's the other thing is it creates a big low pressure pocket, um, which is perfect for lifting um, uh, lifting forces on the on the airplane. Right, which is beyond the scope of what I know. Um, right, I know. I and know you get. I did not do the PhD work on that, so <laughs> I know you get a little either. vortex in there, and that allows yeah. the air to glide over in its, you know, in a normal airfoil fashion. But don't ask me about right. what's going on the, in there. Right, the the layers in the vortices create kind of st- relative streams, um, and so the the that's this effectively creates a, another boundary layer. Mm-hmm. Instead of being from air to skin, it's air to air. Uh, vortices air in that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. So moving along, uh, what we got? Uh, the weeds. Oh, <laughs> Navier Stokes. Um, so, Tag, you're it. <laughs> yeah, this this was... Well, well what, is, what is the Navier Stokes equation trying to do? Like, tell, tell us about that. That's still a big question. So your Navier-Stokes equations were co-opted uh, by two guys, Navier and Stokes. They contributed to it. Uh, and the, this set of equations is an effort to wholly encompassing explain fluid motion. Um, oh, okay. And there's a couple different equations that go into the they go into it um i'm not gonna read off all these uh 
all of these on air, but you've got two equations. Uh, your upper equation is simply your conservation of mass equation, which says mm -hmm. mass must be conserved. I think that's the conservation of mass. It might be a conservation mm -hmm. of energy, but I think it's mass. And then okay. the longer equation on the bottom is your uh, conservation of momentum, I believe, equation. So it's, right. it's Newton's second law that's being fully encompassed in that bottom equation. Um, I want to point out, I pulled the screen cap of these equations from uh, a number file video. And okay. I, I won't try to do justice on how he explained it. Uh, we'll have a link to it. He did a really good job of breaking it down into as good of understandable terms as you could. Um, oh, yeah. I did put this slide in. So conservation of mass was the upper one, and conservation of momentum was the bottom one. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and essentially the conservation of momentum is giving you your mass times acceleration uh, equals mm -hmm. your force. Um, there's a lot of things going on in that equation. Uh, right. But the benefits of these equations, uh, they allow – your uh, engineers of different practices, whether it be uh, aeronautical or uh, what civil or uh, hydro hydro engineers. Yeah, it allows them to do flow analysis in three dimensions, um, mm -hmm. or even mechanical engineers who are doing process work, where they have a mixing unit or a mixing tank or. Mm -hmm. or whatnot yeah there, there's a there's a bunch of different engineering so anything that has a fluid you can this this helps describe and predict motion of fluid which you can use with enough computational force to predict this is why we can actually create predictive models that are very accurate whether it's nowadays yeah whether it's weather uh weather uh weather predictions uh, medicine, uh, it can deal with medicine, uh, f in your bloodstream and how it would, uh, flow and interact through the body. Uh, mm -hmm. there, there's even evidence. I think the, uh, I think I read somewhere that Novier Stokes, uh, can be used in explaining formation <coughs> of stars. Um, wow. and potent, I don't know about, you know, but it's, galaxies, it is flow, but yeah, right? I mean, it's, it's still fluid, and there's forces involved. Um, uh, this picture, other than being beautiful, uh, <laughs> is it describing a pressure gradient? I believe this is a pressure gradient image. Across a wing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Across a cross section of an airfoil. Yeah. Sorry. Um, but going back to the flow analysis, the equations allow your engineers uh, to predict how the air is going to move across an airfoil, um, which becomes important in you know, be able to see that, but also see when that's going to stop. And we'll see that in a minute. Um, it's a, it gives them a better, a better idea of lift and drag on the airfoil. Um, so they'll be able to get pressure distributions, velocity fields. Um, it does, and, and you'll talk about it in a bit, but you get your, uh, what skin level, uh, friction forces, right up right. against the airfoil yeah because you, you can do a, a flow gradient at the skin which is really like a the thin boundary layer mm -hmm. and i thought this equation also helps uh, define how that happens and some more of the details of it and consequently you can then predict a lot of the other issues or the other forces that are on airfoils as well so it really it's pretty comprehensive. It's as you, I mean, you can see the original one is really complex. So, um, yeah. So keep, keep going, please. Yeah, and and that's yeah that boundary layer what we were talking about. Um, your boundary layer analysis uh, right at the surface of the airfoil um, for for predicting where it will be laminar and where it will turn turbulent as air mm -hmm. moves across the airfoil. Um, is really good for predicting the flow separation, which right. we don't want <laughs> uh, in most cases. 
Um, so what is that in other terms that most uh, RCers would know? With uh, essentially you're stalling. So yep. flow, flow separation occurs when your airflow separates from the airfoil. Um, right, you can see uh, in that cross section in the the right. Yeah, the the, air the, the really beautiful, colorful model. Um, yeah. You can see that the flow is no longer following along the wing, and they're they're really the, it's returning to a parallel flow state. And what that means is that when the flow is even and straight, there's no pressure differential, or yeah. there's very little. And if there's no pressure differential between one flow line and the next. It means that there's no lifting force there from mm -hmm. pressure gradient, which means no lift. So as you can see, the whole top of the wing, there's no lift. There might be some lift at the leading right edge of the, the wing on the edge, bottom, yeah. and there and there's a directional change in flow. So there's some forces due to conservation of mass, uh, Newton's equations here, that are going to help create some lift. There's not nearly what it was, mm -hmm. and we'll go into some more of that but it, it's important to kind of take a look at that turbulent air what you're seeing is a uh, wing that looks like a clark y at an angle of attack of about 10 degrees maybe 12 or something mm -hmm. and it's complete fluid flow separation across the top of the wing like from about the two percent <laughs> leading edge there like about two percent in the airfoil and it's all the way back and you basically have a giant you know uh hurricane so it looks yeah, like the, the storm of Jupiter behind the airfoil. I feel like that's mm -hmm. probably closer to like a 30 degree angle of attack that that wings at. I, it might. Yeah, but it might be. It, it's, it's usually around 20, 25 degrees on most wings. Yeah. It, it's in, in this image, it's intentionally uh, exaggerated so mm -hmm. that you can get a clear view of what's happening, which is yeah. the, the air separates and can't, it doesn't stick to the air the airfoil like it was in which case mm -hmm. you're you're not getting that uh bernoulli part of the lift but you're also not really getting the same downward deflection that you would be getting um mm -hmm. and the introduction of that turbulence behind the airfoil is a massive increase on drag and then you lose your lift mm -hmm. so you're falling out of the air essentially um yep so yeah and Good. then numerical simulations, and th this will explain why I had so much so much trouble d trying to do this part. Um, CFDs or computational fluid dynamics is a is the common approach to trying to to working with this. Um, Navier Stokes is is not an equation that you solve like the Bernoulli where you solve it for a, a point along the airfoil. Uh, Navier Stokes is l concerned with the move, the, the movement of a fluid, I guess in relation to other, uh, parts of the fluid over time. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not something that can be quickly or easily just drawn out on paper and calculated, which was what I wanted to do. For this, I was looking, looking, looking. Matt can tell you I was pulling my hair out, trying to find a way to computationally put this here so we could show you guys. Mm -hmm. But it's just beyond the scope of what we can do here. There's software and computers out there designed to run these calculations for analyzing this stuff. And it's because right. when you're looking at this sort of analysis and this equation, you're not you're generally not looking at a point you're, you're looking at the whole picture um, all the effect that's happening above be, below behind in front of and at range from in this case, an airfoil. Um, yeah. And, it's, and it, if, if you look at the original equation, it starts off with uh, rho D U D T. And I can't remember what the U stands for. Uh, a momentum or maybe the viscosity or whatever, the, the but it's what basically a change. The, the U, the U, U bar. Uh, I, I cannot remember what that stands for. So, but whatever mm, that is, it's the remember. change of that over time. That's what the D, D U bar DT mm -hmm. is. It's a, it's a 
basically the mass of the air times this change over time. And you're doing computations for the change over time. So as you go through, you're creating an iterative model. So it's not one pass. You do multiple passes till it, it's what they call converges. Um, we do it in uh, static analysis for less than static items like there's deflections going on mm -hmm. it's like well it keeps moving it's like well okay we'll keep going until it stops moving <laughs> right or to the deflection is so little and then that's essentially what you do is you kind of converge close to zero or at zero if you can um so that's what they're going to do with that equation and it ends up producing these um these accurate accurate computational models of the that you see in this cross section and that Mm -hmm. um, the slide you're looking at. It's, it, and it's really descriptive of what's happening to the airflow around the wing in this situation, right? It's yeah. pretty cool. Um, so that that's sort of the last slide that I have on Navy or Stokes. I really wanted to be able to dive deeper into it. Um, just don't ever ask us again. Just don't do it. <laughs> It'll be easier this way. <laughs> but I just can't. No, I would like to know too. Like I would love to understand it better, but there are PhDs being written about the Navier Stokes and its applications mm -hmm. right now. So, and that's not us. What, what's interesting is the Navier Stokes is one of those equations that, ha, what's the best way to say it? It's not, it's not seen, it's not proven to be a perfect equation yet. Um, right. And it, it has proven to be an accurate, useful representation. Mm -hmm. It's one of, what, what is it in geometry? A proof versus a theorem? Right. The theorems, we, what, that, it's been a long time since I took geometry, but essentially it's a pretty good representation of what's happening, but we can't prove it. Mm hmm. And, and that's essentially what these equations are doing. And the reason for that is when you're looking at uh, fluid dynamics and fluid mechanics and the motion, like any of these things that you're trying to plug into the equation, you can't account for all the particles in that sample. You know, uh, one of the one of the examples brought up, and, and again, I'm pulling heavily my understanding of Navier Stokes from the number file video. So, take a few minutes, go watch that one. We'll have it in the links. But you, you're trying, yeah, you're trying to take almost a near infinite number of variables and have an exact snapshot of what they are, plug them into the equation, and get an output, and it just it can't be done. Um, may never be able to be done. But it is one, Navier Stokes is one of those, what, million dollar uh, equations that are out there, million dollar questions. Uh, there is a bounty out there simply for furthering uh, the mathematical world's understanding of the equations. Just. Mm -hmm. And refining it. Hit that mic. Yep. Um, just because of. <sighs> how tantalizingly out of reach uh, the ultimate solutions on those are, I guess. Yeah. Anyway, but enough on that. That's Navier Stokes is what is generally used in along with the, the computer models uh, when you're, when they're designing, calculating and trying to figure out uh, lift for airfoils and such. You're trying to show me stuff, Matt. Well, and, and what I'm showing uh, our listeners, uh, those who are watching, um, I'm showing two books that I've read through, and they pertain to selecting airfoils for, um, we'll call it private or ultralight aircraft. So if you want to build your own plane, right, these are book references that are um, good ones to get to. Um, the guy who did the um, Facet Mobile, Barnaby Wayne fan, that he has a collection of articles that he put together in this book on selecting an airfoil. And going through this, and I've read through it, um, there's very little mention of the Navier Stokes because to do what you need to do with this, you don't need that. I mean, you can use the program, like XLRF5, I think, which is one of the free available 
uh, airfoil modeling programs and things like that. Really powerful. It uses that Navier Stokes, I'm sure, to get the fluid dynamic models. But it's not when you're trying to do the bulk stuff by hand to get the rough sizing and pick your stuff. It's not going to be needed. But it's important to know what's what's causing these models to be as accurate as they are. Mm -hmm. um, another one is Simplified Aircraft Design for Home Builders by Dan Raymer. I'm going to reference this as I go through some of these things. Um, not extensively, but it's there. And I think one of our guests that we may have on will probably ex reference it extensively. He, But, you know, going through the lift equations and wing loading and things like that, there's a lot of equations that are helpful. Uh, none of them reference that one. Um, but they're essentially, that is the, hey, if you've got unlimited co potential uh, for computation, this equation will get you far closer than any of these bulk calcs. However, these basic numbers, these basic calculations where you can say, hey, I, I need to rough size this. You know, what's the power of the engine I need, right? Or, you know, how, how big of an area of wing do I need? Mm -hmm. um, you want to know those things when you're trying to size your plane. So they're important. Um, unfortunately, that equation is very in the weeds. So let's get out of the weeds and <laughs> see if we can come back. Fair enough. Uh, let's see if I can get this to advance. There we go. Sir Isaac Newton. All right. Yeah. So let's talk about because, you know, not everybody has gotten to the um, level of education where they've gone through the laws of motion, or if you're like me, it's been decades since you had to sit down and learn about it officially. Oh, but, it has um, been that long, hasn't it? I don't want to say it, but it's true. <laughs> um, so Sir Isaac Newton is very famous for his laws of motion, and there are three key ones that describes many, many, many things, so it gets referenced often. Uh, his first law of motion is an object that rests ma maintains at rest and an object in motion remains in motion at a constant speed and in a straight line unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. And that's going to be kind of important, uh, the unbalanced force part. Um, okay, second law of motion is the acceleration of an object depends on the mass of the object and the amount of force applied. So F equals MA, right? And that's a pretty famous equation we know about. And in uh, the Navier-Stokes equation, essentially, uh, some of the other equations in, we just <coughs> passed over, some of the parts of it effectively boil down to F equals MA, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then the third law is uh, whenever one object exerts a force on another object, the second object exerts an equal and the opposite one uh, on the first. So uh, that's simple enough. Uh, so now that you know those laws that we've gone through it, and we, we, you know, there's a lot of talk can be said about them, but just understand that they have proven themselves to be true for hundreds of years, more or less, uh, unless you get deep into the PhD level kind of caveats, um, which is kind of what a lot of this is. So that's, um, so knowing that we can then talk about the deflection or basically the airflow change in direction that happens as an airfoil uh, passes through or the air moves over top of the wing airfoil. You note that when it comes in, it's, it's parallel to the leading edge or, or it is basically um, level with the plane motion and compared to the, whatever the wing is at, right? Angle of attack, yeah. Right. Um, so it comes in straight. When it leaves the trailing edge of the airfoil, it oftentimes is going downward. It is actually um, exiting at a couple degrees below what it came in at. And that differential, that small force, that small distance going down, that's effectively uh, the magnitude of the force of the air uh, change in direction. And that force downward creates an equal and opposite effect, Newton's third law, um, on the wing and actually causes lift on the airfoil itself. Hmm. So there is part of the lift is coming from this deflection. But it's not like a pool cue deflection per se. It's a, the delta, um, the, the change in um, airflow 
angles, right? Right. Uh, let's see. Because if your if your wings at a five degree angle of attack, you may not necessarily get five degrees of deflection, or mm-hmm. if you're at ten. Right. Degrees, it's not going to. Yeah, it's not going to be necessarily exactly with the angle of attack. Mm-hmm. It may not. It may not match. But that that change in airflow direction causes a lifting force. That's what's important. All right, I'm going to try. Uh, to, I'm going to try to guess when you want a slide change, but so now let's talk about the next one, which is, okay. and this is probably, um, this effect is really important, and this is one that's, uh, I don't know, if it's taught poorly, but it's um, oftentimes, I feel like it's hard to describe, but it's not. Um, the Coanda effect is basically uh, a fluid's tendency to follow the, sh- the rounded shape of an object. So it's the stickiness of that fluid as it rolls across the surface of uh, the outer surface of a body, it changes direction, mm-hmm. right? And that change in direction will create a lift. It also creates the pressure difference um, but most importantly, um, that pressure, that so that little curve creates a pressure difference as well as a force. Um, and those things all add up to additional lift. Now, you can, you can check this out yourself with a blank piece of paper. Um, and you can blow, you can basically have it kind of curved over your fingers. And you blow across it horizontal. And it will lift the whole body of the paper up. So it creates lift. And you can also test it by putting it straight down and blowing across the top of that paper while it's straight down, and it won't move the paper, right? It's not going to pull the paper up. Um, But basically what you're doing when you do that is the same thing that happens with the sailboat. Um, And it creates this kind of... So, But we'll notice, and you can also test this Coenda effect by putting like a mug or a spoon... You put a basically a steady flow of, of water, something that's clear. That's essentially a laminar flow where all the all the flow direct are going in the same direction. And you have it hit the outer surface of the spoon or the, the mug, and then it will come around. And if the coin effect wasn't there, and if there's no viscosity causing this fluid to continue to flow around the curved surface, it would fall off. You imagine it basically hit this edge, flow alongside, and then it basically, until gravity took over, which if there was no coenda effect, it would be right at the side of the cup. It just fl- fall straight right. down. Right, once there's no more surface below it. Right, no more surface below it, just goes straight down. However, it doesn't do that. What it'll do is follow that curved surface until the, the weight and, and flow motion of the fluid um, overcomes the 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 Coenda effect pressure differential along the surface that continues to cause it to change direction. Mm-hmm. So once it is overcome, then it'll start flowing down from there. And another example is when you're say trying to pour from one container to another. Yeah. And it's not an exa- It's not so much like you get a little bit on the outside of, the co- of whatever you're pouring. And it just like that drop goes down the side. It's, when you're trying to pour and half of it goes like down the side of the container, you're trying to pour. You're like, how did that happen? It's all over the counter. That's happens this example. To my coffee mug. Yeah, it co- happens to my coffee mug all the time. Right, and um, that and that's even with the little lip that they put on the coffee pots. Yep. Yep. Which is that great and example? The tighter the radius of, of that, right? The cur- the tighter tighter the radius of that curve. Um, the greater the change of direction, the more pressure differential it needs to keep alongside that lip, right? Mm-hmm. Alongside that curve. So um, you can see where this happens at, at spots on the plane. It's obviously the leading edge of the plane. But if you have a leading edge flat where it extends out forward, there's actually airflow between the slot and the leading edge of the wing itself. And then that creates an additional body of lift as well as the any uh, slats some any uh, landing flaps and then if they're slotted it'll flow in between the slots 
and then those also create basically the little airfoils, and they create wing uh, pressures, creating additional lift. Which I guess the wind would be, effect itself. Right. So that's so you're going to be different than if it was just an extended like a flap that just straight up extends out, or mm-hmm. like when we do flapperons on our planes, we use a aileron to extend downward as a flap. You know, your your what slotted it, flaps. Right, if there was a kind of the right, same, but also gap. different. Right, if you had a gap, just a slight gap between your trailing edge that turns into a, a flap, that little gap would create the coind effect there, and mm. it's that change in direction that that creates a, an effect through th- Newton's third law as well. So, okay. let's go on. <clears throat> All right. Yeah. So I, I thought so that was going to auto advance like it has been doing. My uh, well, I tried. I tried. Um, so let's try to pull this together, right? We talked about what it is, and we talked about what it, it is, right? But it's all of them together that create this pressure. And really, what it comes down to is we've been talking about pressure and velocity and areas and all that stuff. It's all of these things coming together in a dynamic way and by dynamic means it's moving it's a moving target Mm -hmm. it's opposed to static which stays put um but when it comes down to it the the largest force by far uh, on the lift the lifting force are, are about pressure and it's basically when the only reason for uh a stream of fluid to change direction is because there is a differential there's something in the way physically deflecting it, right? Or probably more likely and more, more uh, is what's happening in most of the air, airflow airfoils is that when that fluid changes direction, the only reason why it changes direction is because there's a difference in pressure, right? Like if it's essentially a free body diagram, right? It's going, there's a lower pressure downstream, so it's got to move along the stream, right? right. If the particle in front moves forward, that creates a low pressure. The pressure behind it is higher, so therefore it's got to go to the right. Well, down below, so as it moves over top, the, um, the pressure below is lower than the, the pressure on top of that curve, so, which is why it changes direction. Let's see. The pressure up top is higher. I think you're getting that flipped. If, if you're trying to, are you trying to loop that into the Coenda effect? Um, it's uh, ultimately about, and that's the thing is, that was, that was the crux of our gentleman from the UK. At the end of his talk, he talks about, the, the Bernoulli's equation works in a stream flow, but effectively you've got a bunch of free body Items and the only reason why they're going to change direction or move anywhere is if there's an imbalance, right? Mm-hmm. And so if it's going to conform along the wing, it's conforming along the wing because there are forces causing it to push down along the wing, right? There's a differential in pressure, okay. and so what you end up having uh, is a low pressure on top of the wing, but basically what you end up having is there's always a low pressure on the outside of the curve. So if you go back and look at, and we can look at it. Um, I think I know which one, slide you're aiming for. Yeah. And uh, the one that shows the lines below and above. Really good. Uh, yeah, we're getting pretty early in the presentation here. That's because we had some really good slides. Um, sorry. Sorry, guys. We had figured that, um, I think equal transit one would work. Um, I think so. Well, even, even the, and the equal transit, there's a couple diagrams in there that would probably work, right? The last one in that, not the, the next slide, the very last one. You can see that the airflow under the wing, there's a curve, right? So it's a higher pressure on the bottom of that curve where, where it's centered around. 
And then as it curves, that's the upper side is lower. Same with the wing. The, the inner part of that curve is the low and the, uh, sorry, the high pre higher pressure and the top side is lower pressure. And ultimately it needs to equalize. So it's trying to move, it's trying to restore those. And that creates uh, the lifting force. All right, Which let's say kind of what we went through. Yeah, let's say go back over that because I I wasn't following you on that. Okay, so when you look at the look at a wing, it's basically the differential is that the curve of the line, the the where the outside of the curve is, that's going to be a lower pressure, always, and the inside of that curve is going to be higher pressure. And that's what causes the, the curve to happen. And ultimately, when you have, you're trying to have it equalize the force, so it, it wants to move from uh, high pressure to low pressure. And when it's doing that, it's creating a reactionary force that ends up being lift on the wing. Um, but if you want to understand where the high and low pressures are, you look at that line gradient. And wherever there's a curve, the top of that is low pressure, the inside of that curve is higher pressure. Okay. And so you can even see on that one, that while you see it in the, in the top, that's obvious because it's following the curve of the wing and partly because those pressure differentials within the flows themselves, um, as well as, you know, over our overarching, but that's a lower pressure up above. And then at the wing, it's a little higher pressure and same with underneath the wing. You can see there is also another curve. But if you go with different shaped airfoils, you can see that that curve changes. Um, if you look at the Horton wing that has like the, the end of the wing, uh, for example, uh, that really doesn't help because that's not what these are. Um, I'm going to just pull this. Like if this was the opposite and we were to flip it and this, this tail kind of comes up a little bit, that change in direction causes an inverse curve, which means the pressure differential is going the opposite way. It actually sucks the back of the wing down. Okay. Instead of trying to turn it over. So it actually has a better coefficient of moment. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Yeah. That becomes and important when you're trying to figure out how you want your wing to perform. So feel free in post when you're editing this um, to just grab our cameras and stick your own graphic off to the side that you find that is a good diagram of what you're explaining there, I guess, in, uh, okay. in well, place we'll, of me flipping back and forth through fine. all the slides. Or we'll just let it go. We'll see how it goes. Okay. When I look at it, it may be just, you know, put a, put a thing up. All right. So back to it. Um, so that's kind of what you want to ultimately kind of, what I say is uh, that's what you want to take away because this all boils down to the differences in pressure, the velocity, the angle of attack. Um, these are all parts of that pressure formula, right? Uh, the roughness and, and it's, you know, all of those things work towards creating the flight envelope. The, the, at what point does this airflow separate? Do we lose lifts? You know, all those things become important, right? Mm -hmm. So um, we talked about, and this is a reminder of some of the tools that we've used, we've talked about, um, trying to figure out if we want to look at generic loading, um, you know, how heavy is your plane loaded for its size? Cubic wing loading is another thing that um, if you can figure it out, it, it's irrespective of the size of the aircraft you're looking at. Um, so it gives you a general performance characteristic okay. that you can expect to see from the plane, no matter what size it is or weight or whatever, it will tell you that it's got a cubic wing loading of this. And if you look up the reference numbers, um, you know, one through three or something, I think is, is a glider. And then, you know, 15 or something is like a fighter, right? So it's heavier. Okay. Um, uh, we also have uh, flight performance, um, and that's what I'm going to use here in a little bit, is airfoiltools.org. It is, um, it's basically a catalog of all the airfoils that have ever been tested, and it yields basically the test results for that airfoil, given different Reynolds numbers. We'll talk about what Reynolds numbers are in a second. 
Um, and then, of course, uh, if you want to go for a free aircraft design um, program, XLRF5, you can create an airfoil and have it do a CFD analysis. Um, and it can tell you what's going to happen to your wing during flight, what to expect. All right, let's fly slide 34. Yeah. Um, and I showed you two books referencing Dan Raymer's simple aircraft design for home builders because it goes through how to pick out airfoils, roughly how to size your plane, how big of a power plant do you need, where do you start, what what design considerations should you look at first and second and third and then how some of it is ballpark estimates of how each component plays into the aerodynamic um performance of the plane uh airfoil selection by barnaby Wainfan, who is actively developing um a kit build version of his um facet mobile but this is a collection of articles on how to what what it means what i like about this book uh, very specifically, we've, we talked about, it goes over what, what different shape factors do to the lift coefficient. So does it move it so it has higher lift? Does it move it so it has higher drag? Does it move it so it stalls better or worse? And that's more, is it a sharper stall angle uh, or, or gentle? Um, it goes through some of the, like, how do you create lift and what all that stuff means. And it goes through what all the charts are. And then, you know, there's a whole, there's a whole set. Like what is the leading edge uh, nose? You know, you have a leading edge droops down. Why do they do that? Oh, it's like, oh, I want to extend the lift curve. Because that extends it out to a higher angle of attack degree. That's what that does. Okay. And you can see it with the um, coefficient of lift versus angle of attack chart. And we'll, we'll go through that in a little bit here. Because that's part of what we're trying to do. So how, how do we turn this knowledge of, oh, okay, now we understand. Hopefully by now we've at least described the forces and the parts and pieces that are in lift, right? Right. Um, so let's see if we can't use those things to um, pick airfoils or select, uh, yeah, select airfoils that will work for what we're trying to aim for. How do you create that coefficient of lift? Because if you think about it, when we talked about how much can your plane lift, it all hung on coefficient of lift. And that all depends on where airfoil you select and a number of these other factors. So as we go through, I'm going to remind you some of the terms. The cord is from the leading edge to the back edge. Angle of attack is the angle um, in respect to the flow, the angle of the cord line to the flow direction of the air it's encountering. The camber is a percent offset from the camber line uh, of, of the airfoil curve. Uh, thickness to cord ratio is basically the percentage of the cord length uh, oh, to what? its thickness. Okay. The, to the thickness of the airfoil itself. Uh, max camber location tells you at what point is that camber going to be highest. And that can be anywhere between, I think, 20% to 80%, right? So where does it lay on the cord of the wing, you know, 50% would be right in the middle. Leading edge radius is important. That tells a lot about some of the stall characteristics that you can expect. Really? Um, mm -hmm. So the rounder the airfoil, while it is a higher drag, you have a greater angle of attack that will continue to support the coanda effect occurring. If it's sharp, as you increase angle of attack, it will create a leading edge stall and it will lose lift across the whole thing quickly. No, oh, yeah, because so the the it'll be fine. Has to cut a much harder right. round to so, like, okay. Right. The small leading edge is great because it's lower drag. However, it, it's also when you lose lift, you're gonna lose it all. And it's all gonna be all at once. Mm -hmm. So it's gonna be a very violent stall characteristic. Um, which maybe that's something that you're okay with because you don't ever anticipate going past that um, stall angle, right? All or, right, or um, if you do, you think you've got the the engine power to power through it. Mm -hmm. yep, exactly. Um, I'm going to go through the NACA, the NACA, which is the predecessor to NASA, uh, National Aeronautical. I forgot to write it out. Um, what, but NASA? they're the predecessor. Nope, NACA. NACA. 
Yeah, yeah. I can't remember what it stands for. Sorry, they, um, they had one ear off. It's it's NAS, a NASA's predecessor, and I, I apologize for not having that on hand in my head. Um, four, they had created a four, five, and six-digit system to help describe airfoils so that you don't have to uh, list off a whole set of categories and characteristics and all those different things to describe an airfoil. Instead, they said, hey, just four digits, it'll be fine. Um, the first digit is the the camber to cord length times 10%. So so if it's a two, that's 20% is where the camber is at, right? Or uh, 20 location, to 29% because you're taking the first digit. Yeah, is, is how much camber for the... So it's 20% 20, 20 thickness airfoil, right? Okay. That's what the two is. Um, the second digit, or the four in this case, for the example of 2412 airfoil, is the location of the max camber times 10% along the length from the leading edge. So that's where is the center of the bump, right? Where does that, does it start in the beginning? Is it highest in the beginning or is it high at the end, the middle, wherever? At four, that's 40% down from the leading edge. That's where the maximum camber is gonna be. And then thickness ratio is a two digit percentage number. And that's the last two digits, so 12%. So the, this airfoil is 12% of the cord. That's how thick it is. Okay. okay. So I just want to talk about that because there'll be occasional mentions of just, and that's one of the easiest ways. If you kind of have an idea as to what shape you want, you can do some measurements and determine the, the closest NACA four digit system you want. Okay. Uh, we covered some of the other systems, I think, in other, uh, other previous um, talks on this topic. Bit, yeah. So. Uh, I'll leave it to them, or I'll leave you to go to airfoiltools.com because they or .org, sorry, because uh, they do describe it in pretty good detail. Um, so when you're trying to figure out your airfoil, you're really trying to figure out what coefficient of lift do I need to be able to figure out how much lift I. Because you have a, uh, let's say you have a plane, you know how much it weighs. You go, well, what do I need it to be able to lift, right? So you figure out what your, how are you going to fly? In our case. Um, you, you need to figure out your Reynolds number, which is basically what kind of conditions do you expect the air to be performing at during landing and in cruise. So basically when you're flying full tilt, right? Mm -hmm. um, and Reynolds number is a, I think I have a slide on the Reynolds numbers, but you as do. I understand it, it is a ratioed um, number that you can you can use its scale and there is a direct relationship to full scale. So if you figure out how things work in a, a small scale at a wind tunnel, you can then apply that to full scale and use it as a predictable model mm -hmm. and be able to bank on it. So it's like, well, if it performed well in the air tunnel, then it will perform likewise in full scale. So one of the reasons why people really love the, oh, I love the Reynolds numbers. But we'll talk about that in a second here. Uh, it helps you determine a lot of the other things like uh, the drag and the thrust, which corresponds to how much thrust you're going to need, what speeds you might need to get at. Um, you want to know how how fast you're going to land, right? Is it going to be a speedster on the landing? Like jets land really fast, but um, little cubs go really slow. And if you're like in an ultralight, you are limited to 55 miles an hour. Um, and then you have uh, max, and I think they have a, a landing speed of, I think, 40 knots is what they aim for. Um, and then you can use that to help determine your lift value and optimize your wing to, to meet performance requirements, right? Mm -hmm. So the Reynolds number, um, I'd show you the equations over there. And what, you know, you can see that's a direct relationship between the kinematic viscosity and the dynamic viscosity, pretty much. The rest are pretty equal, right? There's a uh, there's a velocity, there's a the characteristics of the length of the, of the wing and the pressure or the, the density of the air, right? Those are pretty constant, but the difference between the two parts of the, the Reynolds number are the dynamic and kin kinematic. So the, um, so again, what the biggest piece for that is if you're going to look at like what kind of craft or what Reynolds numbers should I ballpark with? Um, again, you put in your length, you put in your velocity, the rest is kind of known. 
um, and it will spit out a Reynolds number for you. So that's why you want to know how fast you're going to land and how long your cord is or in your different situations. So um, for model aircraft, we tend to use like 20,000. And these numbers are like 10 million to 20,000. They're not like one, two, or 10. Right? I think we, we mentioned that. And yeah, it's kind of this unit, unitless number that helps us kind of transform um, the fluid flow into numbers we can use for lift, really, is what that means. Um, so birds are 20,000. So that's usually like the crews I'll use. 200. Uh, 200,000. Thank you. <laughs> I say 20,000. Um, uh, the high Reynolds numbers are going to be for like normal airplanes, ultralights, things like that will be 1 million. And then 10 million will be stuff like airliners. And, and that goes higher than that, right? Does it? Yep. <clears throat> so the whole point is if the Reynolds number is the same for two, a two shaped air, aircraft, two same two of the shaped. same shaped aircraft, the performance will be the same. Mm hmm. Not the same scale, but the same shape. And that's what Reynolds Law kind of states. And that's how they use that. That's why they always talk about, oh, we need to put this in the wind tunnel. They're building a scale model of their plane, seeing how it performs. And the relationship is kind of inverse. So the smaller it is relationship-wise, the faster the airflow has to be to create a meaningful value that they can use in real life. Because they know what it's going to be in real life. They figured out how fast they want to go. So mm -hmm. what they do is they put in the wind tunnel at a relationship of velocity for the air. So they speed up the air like crazy. But no matter how, if it performs one way on the model, it will perform identically at that same Reynolds number for larger aircraft. Okay. <coughs> that's, that's the really the crux of this. And that's why it's so important and why people get so excited about it. It's pretty complex. You can definitely go down the rabbit hole on this one. Um, but we're going to basically use 200,000 and I think uh, 20,000 for the values we need. Okay. Um, and so we go to the next slide. We have based on the calculation below, I compare the different values of what rho is. And you can see like I've kept the cord the same and I'm just changing the velocity of the air. The, uh, the air density is the same, which is basically... Um, uh, ground density, and you can see there is a big difference, 50,000, 200,000, and 1 million, right? Right. If I'm going 80 miles an hour, 16 miles an hour, or 4, right? Mm -hmm. So those are, that's how you can see how it, it varies. And at the airfoil tools, that's where I pulled this from, airfoiltools.org. Uh, that's where I pulled these uh, cross sections. We have a link here, and you can select different airfoils, and you can then compare them and compare their performances. You can list all the Reynolds numbers you want to see. We're going to select 50,000 and 200,000 based on kind of what we determined earlier in the last slide. <clears throat> um, you can see I'm, I'm going to compare a Clark Y, a Geo 52, or uh, Gop, I think it's a Gotlandham or something, uh, G Joey uh, 525, FX M2. FX73170. Uh, they all kind of have very different, you can see they have very different profiles. Mm -hmm. One has uh, the GO525 has an aft camber. Um, the FXM2 is pretty much almost like a flat plate, <laughs> really. Yeah. Um, the Clark Y is what most um, flight test planes, that's kind of what, when you build that airfoil, that's essentially what you're building is a Clark Y. And then the flow on the bottom, the one on the bottom, the FX73. Uh, 170, that is, a, as I understand it, is a laminar flow uh, airfoil. So it performs really well. It'll have a little pocket. And I'll, I'll, describe, I'll see if I can see it. But there should be a little pocket of decreased. So during the laminar flow condition, there will be a, a significant, a visible drop in drag on that airfoil. Hmm. So, and when you put that that pocket of reduced drag in the cruise spot, then you have a really efficient plane. You go from having a pretty efficient plane to going, oh, wow, this is ridiculous. <laughs> Which is how a lot of um, Burt Rutan stuff works. 
Um, so then we take that and we give it the Reynolds numbers we want to plot, and that's what these these represent. Um, I think I've only selected one uh, Reynolds number. I think I selected 50,000, maybe 200,000. Um, and this is how they perform. So the first chart you'll see, and I'll show that what it tends to spit out, is uh, coefficient of lift for that airfoil versus the alpha angle, the angle of attack. You can see zero is not the, you can see you can go negative 10 degrees and it still produces some lift. Actually produces downward lift. And then at about, looks like two degrees, negative two or three degrees, it starts producing positive lift on some of these here, right? Right. Um, and then what you can see, so you can see the, the gradient's about the same. It's pretty linear. Uh, it's the same uh, gradient angle. But you can see as it approaches the higher angles of attack, different aerofoils do different things, right? The Clark Y tends to kind of flatten out and almost dip and just sort of hang a while to like 20 degrees before it completely stalls. Right. So it has a very mushy stall characteristic. I'm not sure that that's entirely right. Maybe part of, partly at that Reynolds number it does this, and oftentimes at higher Reynolds number, numbers it'll, it'll match this more golden FXM2 curve. Um, you'll see that the FXM2, the, the curve at the top of the airfoil is more gentle, right? It flattens out a little bit more. Um, the FXM2 is pretty, a little bit steeper, has a, qu a quicker dip off. And then the 7317, you can see that it only reaches 1.5 coefficients of lift. The rest of them, same with the Clark Y, they reach about coefficient of lift of one and a half at 10 degrees or so, 12 degrees. Whereas the Clark, uh, whereas the, was it Geo525 and the FXM2, they tend to have like 1.8. They have a much higher coefficient of lift. So if you need a wing that will lift a lot, um, you need to take off a runway and you, you need to get it boogieing um, and you want to make sure you have plenty of lift for it. Those might be your airfoils. Chances are you're going to pay for that in something with drag or something else. So we'll see. Go fish in a moment. So what this uh, program will spit out is these five graphs for any given airfoil and any given Reynolds number or a bunch of them so you can kind of compare. So then it goes on to look at coefficient of lift, coefficient of drag. And this is where you see that bucket. If you look at the, the far left item, you'll see it like 0.5, maybe 0.3 um, coefficient of lift. You'll see that left one most kind of dips in a little bit and reduces drag by maybe 10%. Mm -hmm. And it's a minuscule amount, but if you're cruising and you're in that sweet spot, you just saved yourself a couple gallons, right? Here's um, what you can me. see. Yeah. Look at this. This messed me up the first time you were showing this stuff to me. In this co coefficient of lift versus co coefficient of drag chart, I'm accustomed to standard X, Y plotting. Mm. Yeah. Where there's the one y value per. Right. Well, the Y is coefficient of lift. And the D uh, and the X value is this coefficient of drag. So the vertical comes first in the labeling system. Sure, and but you're yeah. still getting two values mm -hmm. on a on an X axis. I guess the argument is you could like rotate it ninety degrees and then it works fine. But even then. Like look at it, right. the way those lines curve, you get doubling up of value. So what is that about? What do you mean the doubling up of values? I just want to make sure I understand it right. You mean that the curves kind of stay on top of each other? or No, like if you take a single curve. So let's take yeah. like, let's take the GO525 or the, the That's GOE. That's the blue one. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Let's say Got the GOE525. And right. Looking at it in the coefficient of lift versus coefficient of drag, mm -hmm. it by or save an X Y plotting that graph shouldn't be like that. Because it's just saying that as you as you approach your coefficient of lift being around two, maybe one point seven five. Which, if you look at a coefficient of lift time uh, versus alpha, that would be a seven degree angle of attack. 
As you approach the seven degree angle of attack, you see the drag coefficient goes significantly higher, which means it's gonna create a lot more drag force. And to, for your propeller to go any faster, it's gonna have to do a lot more work. Does that make sense to you? A bit, again, it just, I don't know. We may have talked about yeah. this one off screen because okay. no matter how you orient but, that particular okay, now, graph at uh, at any given x value, you can like there's a couple areas where at an x value you'll have multiple y values. Right. Okay. I I get you. So you're saying is like well, it's it's uh, almost two and it's also negative. It's like zero, right? Right. Or point point two or whatever it is. What that's saying is that as the coefficient of lift goes down to 0.5, which is at negative 8 degrees or whatever it is on that, on that airfoil. So if you look at the graph next to it, coefficient of lift versus alpha, that kind of tells you at what angles these coefficient of lifts are happening, right? And then as you move the coefficient of lift up and down this graph, you're seeing that the drag is either increasing or decreasing. as the coefficient. So basically, as your angle of attack goes up and down, it, you would be moving around this curve, right? So the bottom half would be the bottom half of the coefficient versus alpha curve. As you move that up, it would move left towards the lower coefficient of drag as that lift would maintain, that coefficient of lift would, main, would match on both graphs. Does that make sense? I and part of so. why you see it kind of dip up Right? It seems weird, but if you look at the coefficient of lift versus alpha, when you get to negative 10, it kind of comes back up. Right? Does mm -hmm. that weird little kind of kick up? And that's what's happening in the coefficient of lift, or the coefficient of drag. As the drag gets even, you're, you're getting even steeper of an angle, the lift goes up and the drag goes crazy. <laughs> okay. Okay? And so what you're doing is you're actually like using, I use the coefficient of lift versus alpha kind of understand what's happening with the airfoil versus the angle of attack. And then I use that to co to also correspond what's happening with the drag. Right, like at what point is my drag going to get silly? At what point is it not efficient at all? Right, am I going to have a hard time getting any faster? So my real angle of function is going to be from, you know, what is that, uh, negative... 10 to looks like um, seven degrees, right? So that's my usable range Okay. on that airfoil. Okay, so then you also use that to compare to the other parts of the graph, right? So it's like, well, what is all this? Coefficient of drag versus alpha. That's the same kind of deal where you can see that the depending on the angle of attack, you're going to have significantly higher so you got this low bucket, and then you, this low bucket on the bottom, it's this U-shaped graph. And the bottom of the bucket is most of the alpha range, most of the angles of attack. You see the blue one kind of comes up at a almost steady angle. So you actually, as you change the angle of attack, you're increasing your drag. But not everyone does that, right? You look at um, the green one, the Clark Y. That stays a steady, steady um, drag coefficient all the way up until about 10 degrees or seven degrees and then it starts to increase, mm -hmm. but it's solid the same all the way plus and minus seven degrees. So it's steady. Like you don't have to, it's not going to get draggier as you start increasing your angle. Okay. It's going to stay the same. And then same with the, so you can look at that with the different airfoils. So it's easy when you kind of plot one, but I wanted you to see that these shapes show something very different. You see, um, the 525, that one that had the big aft camber, right? It, it has a higher coefficient of lift. And it's, it starts out with a higher lift early on. Like, it just wants to float compared to yeah. the other ones, right? And, and even then, like, it, it's got a big round nose. So that, that um, stall characteristic at the end is just wide and mushy. You'd, I mean, you'd, you'd fly it, it look mushy. But compare that to the coefficient of moment. It has that, that big camber at the aft end of the wing, which means it's going to try to pitch that nose way over. It could be negative. 
right? That's the negative direction. Positive is in the direction of the lift, right? Okay. So negative coefficient is what we want because we don't want to actually add to the lift when we're stalling, right? That's the last thing you want to make a stall worse. Okay. But you can see that in that blue line, the coefficient of lift is down near 25%. It's huge compared to the 5% or 8% or so of the was it Clark Y and all the other wings, really. And you can see it's versus an alpha. So you can see it's a, you can compare it to, as it's lifting like crazy, what is it going to do? It's going to try to pitch over as hard as it can. Mm -hmm. It's going to try to bring that nose way down. <laughs> like you're going to have to fight hard to keep that nose angle high. Okay. And that might be what you want, but that's something you, but what that means is the lower the coefficient of moment, this is when you have a flying wing, you have to fight that somehow, and you don't have surfaces to be able to do that. The bigger the coefficient of moment, the bigger your tail has to be to counteract that, and the higher the drag is going to be. So you want the moment low, <clears throat> the lift high, the drag as low as you can for as long as possible, which all of these things are impossible to do all at once. Right. Pretty close. Otherwise, we'd have one airfoil to rule them all, right? <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, so that's what these charts mean, though. Like when you start looking at like how they relate to each other and what they mean about how your plane performs, like, oh, oh, okay. That's why they do that. That's why people get excited about doing the Epler airfoils or the certain, you know, uh, laminar flow airfoils because they have this little drag bucket for, for, from like 0.3. Uh, lift to like 0.8 lift and it's for you know a, a couple angles of alpha yeah and it's just this little like special and that's the cruise spot that's where you you set it up so that the, it will cruise at that angle of attack during the, and, and needing only that much lift and it will cruise at this crazy ridiculously low drag and you can see the the coefficient of lift uh lift first drag number that's a ratio, right, versus the alpha. You can see that the lift gets much higher and the drag goes low, right, as you get in that sweet spot in the alpha range, usually near zero mm -hmm. or two degrees. But as it rotates, it continues to rotate, it's going to start dropping off, right? It's not going to be as efficient. You know, it's not going to have as much high lift. And you can see, what is that, the Clark Y? It has a real sharp angle. And, but once you get past about seven degrees, it's not worth it. Right. So if you're going to build a plane, you better only have it operate at about seven degrees angle of attack. After that, it's going to fail pretty hard. So anyway, th so you can use these to kind of understand what performance you're going to expect from the airfoil. Um, if you do the nose droop, that coefficient of lift versus alpha will just continue up at that angle, that, that lift angle, that diagonal. It'll keep going further. So the angle of attack will extend if you do that nose droop thing that we talked about. All right, let's move on to the next airfoil. Okay. So, and that's where you look at um, wing shapes. And so I gave you the four different wing shapes there. You know, the bigger the camber, the higher the lift, but the, the higher the drag that comes with it. If you get a really smooth laminar flow, you'll get that little special lam that bucket of low drag, which is awesome, except... If you're outside of that, it's no more or less special. And you also, the, you also have to have laminar flow for that to function right. So if you have a bunch of bugs to the leading edge of your wing, you're not getting laminar flow. And so you have to make sure that that's happening. You have to make sure you have a clean, clean wing every time, right? <clears throat> uh, we talked about the leading edge radius. That small uh, radius will create a sharp stall um, that, that will it'll drop off hard whereas large will be gentle and mushy when it stalls. You'll barely even notice it happens. Mm -hmm. um, but the you're going to have high drag. You're going to have higher drag, right? And the thickness effect is the same thing. The higher the thickness, the more differential in pressure, right? Because mm -hmm. we looked at the way those curve. The higher the curve, the bigger the pressure differential, the higher the lift. However, it comes with the cost of drag, which means the, higher, the bigger the motor you need to drag it through the air. So if you're trying to make a very efficient motor, you want to have as low a drag with as high as lift as you need, making the plane as light as possible. You can see that, again, as I keep talking, it's all back and forth. It's all trade-offs. It's all give and takes. 
and you're trying to find a best fit, and it's not easy to determine. There's also, like, I don't know, I think there's 2,000-some-odd airfoils in the airfoil database Jeez. in there. Plus, you can make your own, which is cool. And as a matter of fact, I'm hoping that we can get on a guest who um, he runs a YouTube channel about the ultralights. I've talked about him before. But he goes through, he's like, I, I liked what this did. I wanted to see what happens if I move the center of camber forward and back 10 to 10 percent what if i moved it forward to the 20 percent instead of 30 or mm -hmm. to the 40 right and then he looked at it and it, sure enough it gave him all the things he wanted and at 40 percent actually increased his lift value so he could try you know the the drag wasn't any better or worse but the lift was way better and the, the way it looks as a whole video on it, it's great so I, to me that like really solidified like oh wow so you can put your custom airfoils in there. You can also have them plotted out, and you can use those to actually cut out wings in yours. You can help that design the wings you're going to build for your future aircraft in model aircraft. Because while the air does not scale, it does have similar effects. The same shapes of the airfoil will still have similar effects on your planes. Mm. Not identical, but it'll, it'll be similar. So that is kind of important. If you start learning this and how the airfoil shape helps predict um, the performance of the aircraft, it'll help you select the airfoil you want for the craft you're making. Okay. Which is why I went into this, because now that we know where lift comes from, you can see that the, the higher the curve, the higher the coanda effect, the more the pressure differential, the higher the lift, the, the bigger the angle the more deflective energy you're also getting too. The redirection of the airflow plays a bigger fact, factor in that lift, but it also creates a bigger block for, <laughs> for the motor to pull the plane through. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, you got to kind of balance it all. All right. I think, I think it's, <laughs> so that's my kind of take of, as we put it together, this is how we can take that information we just learned and use it. Mm. All right, so let's see what, what's well, the next one. We, well, I think the next bit gets into listener questions that yeah. came in on Lyft. So we put it out there as a general, hey, we're going to be doing this. So if you got questions about Lyft in general that maybe we can try to approach as part of this. So this sort of uh, tied up all those loose ends. Okay. Uh, and, we, again, uh, we did our best with this. And... It actually helps uh, Joe and I know some guests we might want to bring in. I've already thought of a couple people I want to bring in for the helicopter um, discussion because we had a rudimentary one way back, like years ago. Um, it's important we revisit it, but I don't fly air, air uh, rotorcraft. Oh, boy. I don't fly helicopters. <laughs> it's getting late. Um, I don't because they're really expensive. Like, they're very expensive, and I don't have that kind of money. Um, and they, but I did they scare me, like the, the thought of flying yeah. one. Just well, I think they call them like flying blenders, I think is what a lot of people <laughs> like. I don't necessarily scimitars. worry about hitting myself with it. Just the, like, yeah. Yeah. that's yeah. not an easy thing to fly. No, although today's day and age, the, the, the computer chips that help you control it really make a big difference between anybody can fly it and, oh boy, you need a lot of training before you even start. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway. So this, next, this first question comes from about helicopter. That's kind of why I mentioned it. Uh, could you cover how lift is generated and controlled for helicopters? Um, so the blades of a helicopter are no different than, I mean, they are different, but they're not a whole lot different than the blades of a propeller um, on an airplane. They're just longer and thinner. Again, you're getting a better aspect ratio on that. Um, they're an airfoil, and they spin. So they spin... In the center, they don't spin very fast. But at the, the wing tips, so way out at the edge, at, what, 20 feet out, they're they are going moving. extremely fast. And oftentimes, the, the noise you're hearing is oftentimes them breaking the sound barrier, coming extremely close to doing that. Um, and so each blade is connected to a center rotor that rotates. Um, each blade is tiltable to change the angle of attack. Mm -hmm. Um, both each individual one as it spins around 
Uh, and that is done with the swash plate or the cyclic, which actually changes the pitch of the rotor as it rotates around. And then you can control all of them together, which basically say, if I want to go up, I want all of the blades to change the angle of attack to increase the lift, right? So I'm going to change the collective, mm -hmm. which is basically moving the elevator uh, more or increasing the, thr the thrust. And so you do the collective pitch. And so the whole rotor swash plate will shift up and down in the collective. And then the cyclic will rotate the swash plate. And it's basically a rotor that has, uh, can move in 360 degrees angle, angle wise. Um, and then, so there's a couple, I think there's three arms that control its angle. Much well, like a 3D printer, you know, those three angle, three arm 3D printers. Right. Um, and it controls the pitch of the blades as they roll around. And to make it more confusing, because that's how these work, um, there is gyroscopic precession going on there. And so what's happening happens and affects the craft at 90 degrees out of phase with the uh, with the actual effect. Right? It's part of the P factor of a plane. Okay. So as it's spinning, you're getting one blade is doing more than the other, and therefore it's turning. It's it's cr anyway. It, <laughs> that's why I want an expert. <laughs> yeah. All I know well, is it's starts to possession. It's creating a force ninety degrees. So if if it happens at the back, it's actually occurring on the side of the plane. So all of these swash buckle or the cyclic is actually happening 90 degrees out of phase so that it affects... Uh, okay. Like, if you want to go left, you're not actually turning the swash plate left. You're actually pushing it forward because forward, 90 degrees, is left. Okay. And then <laughs> I'm going to add one more... I think more. I got that right. Yeah, I'm going to add one more bit to the equation, which is mm -hmm. when a helicopter's in, uh, in forward flight, okay, so it's flying mm -hmm. forward at whatever velocity... The because rotors are rotating what clockwise, whatever. Uh, right. the, the airfoil, the wings, the rotors, the airfoil that's advancing, that's moving towards from the back of the chopper to the front, <laughs> is actually going to experience higher airspeed than the than it on its return path right. from the front of the helicopter to the back. It's and that go, differential velocity creates more lift on one side than the other. Lift, yeah. yeah. So they actually, so the rotors have to take that into account in their angle of attack as <laughs> right. well. Which, dang. Yeah. <laughs> on top of that, while the rotators are rota rotating, they're creating an equal and opposite rotational force on the aircraft itself, which means the rot the aircraft is trying to rotate the other way. Which means there is a set of blades on the back of the tail of the plane to counteract the body rotation of the of the aircraft or of the helicopter itself mm -hmm. <clears throat> that that keeps the body of the aircraft ro relatively in one direction and so as you sp and that's the other thing you can do so you can control the overall pitch of the blades the individual pitch in the rotation angle right as well as you can speed up and speed down the rotor blade. So you can rotate that much like with an airplane, right? You want to go faster, you speed it up. So if you want to go higher quickly, you speed up the motor and the rotors turn faster. Consequently, the body wants to rotate with it. So you need to turn the rotor, the tail blades up even more. Which or is handled change the pitch. through pedals much like your plane's rudder. Like a rudder, right. Yep. But it's really changing the pitch of the aircraft aft rotor blades. Mm -hmm. I think if it's not the pitch, it's changing the speed. And I yeah, can't remember which. I, I, and I think it depends on the plane it's, or the, it the helicopter might. itself. So all of those things, it's really cool. Because the, the fact that it was figured out and it was done well, like hot stuff. Um, good good job, Sikorsky and other helicopter manufacturers. They've, they've done incredible work there. It's come a long way, certainly, from its uh, ancestry. Um, I hope that described it well enough. We've got a really good graphic, I think, that that explains it pretty well as well. Um, it's definitely a topic. If you want to see more, let us know in the Discord. If you'd like to have a helicopter guy come in and, and talk about how this all works. Because um, I'd love to delve deeper into it. But I hope that helped uh, understand how the lift is generated. Also, why, if you're going to pick up an RC aircraft, 
the for helicopters, the controls are way different. They're just not the same. <laughs> they, they're not even close. So get I, somebody. To I wouldn't want to try. No. no it, it would be. It's cool. Like it's really cool. But again, get somebody to help. Yeah. As somebody who who's done it before, they can help you get through the starting. Um, chicken dancing. All right. Next question. All right. Center of lift versus center of gravity. Um, what, why, what are these? Why are they different? What's the big deal? Mm -hmm. um, center of gravity is basically if you were to grab any point in the plane and drop a line through it, where that line intersects, that's the center of gravity, center of mass. That's where the plane is pivoting about when it's forces. Say that definition being again. If you were to hang the plane from any one part of it around the extremity or whatever, and you were to drop a gravity line through it, basically drop a plumb bob, where that plumb bob would go through in that plane, the point where they all intersect, that's the center of mass, which is also the center of gravity. Okay. I, I'm sure that makes sense in your head. I'm not following it. Take all your masses, all your weight throughout the plane, and find the center point left, right, to front, to back. That's your mm -hmm. center of gravity. And actually top to bottom. And it's, top to bottom. Again, it, the it is a three dimensional point. So if you grab the tail and drop the plumb bob and then each wing and each the nose and the top and the bottom, where they all intersect, that's essentially where your C, C of G is. <clears throat> it's it's the point at which the airplane or the aircraft will rotate. Mm. Okay? Now there's a center of lift, or also known as the center of pressure, which is where the lifting pressure acts. And that's why we're doing all those line diagrams around the wing and trying to, trying to sum up all the vector forces to figure out where, where the lift force is acting on the wing. And what we need to determine is to make sure that the lifting body or the, the center of pressure is happening in front of the center of mass. Mm -hmm. We commonly call it the... And it's usually like 25% of where the, the wing cord is um, on average. And there's a whole method, we've talked about it before, where you get the uh, mean dynamic or the mean cord. <sighs> what is that? What's that called? Shoot. <clears throat> I'll think of it. Okay. Or I'll look it up. Ha. Well, while you're looking that up, uh, important to know when you're, when you're considering the center of lift, while say we're with us doing the foam board airplanes we assuming that your horizontal stabilizer is in line with the uh direction of airflow when you're flying so it's not imparting any sort of lift your your center of lift has to take into account the wings if you have any sort of lift force going on with your horizontal stabilizer and the whole body of the aircraft if it has any right. lift characteristics to it, all that combined creates your center of lift. And your center of lift is also in a three-dimensional space, which, <laughs> go back a few episodes, we were talking about high mount versus mid mount versus low mounted wings and right. the effects so all that can have. And, and most of the, those forces sum up somewhere about in the wing. Mm -hmm. You know, the primary wing, the, the rear tail... And the rudders tend to have little, little pressures, I guess. No, but they're worth taking into account. Well, no, no they make a big difference because it will shift that back. And if if the center of lift is behind, behind the center of gravity, you're in. It won't fly again. <laughs> you'll you'll get up in the air, but it will be once. Um, no, so it's the mean aerodynamic cord is what I was thinking about. So you basically figure out where the mean aerodynamic cord is. There's a couple of methods to do that. We've talked about that in the past. Um, and oftentimes the lift is going to be at the 25% of the mean aerodynamic cord. Oftentimes the CG. Um, no, we're good. Um, that's something totally different. I was looking at a different diagram. So the CG is uh, going to be slightly behind that, oh. usually. Well, that's where, yeah, you want your center of lift slightly, center of lift slightly behind your center of gravity. Because your center of gravity is behind your center of lift, then you get tail heavy characteristics. 
Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I agree with that. I can't remember. That's tail heavy versus nose heavy. Uh, yeah, okay. I got you. Yep. You're right. I'm okay. thinking about it wrong. You're okay. I just wanted... I think, you, you said yeah. something earlier. I wanted to make sure that was you know, clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. All right. Uh, let's move along. Wing loading. Uh, what the heck is it and why is it important? Uh, okay. Um, so I took it two ways at first. Um, so wing loading is the load or the weight of the plan that a plane that's that has to be lifted by the, the wing lifting bodies. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's usually the wing. Uh, load is spread across the wing, uh, such as the lift is uh, also um, spread across the wings as well. It's dependent on the contributing areas and all the other stuff. Like you said, when you add it all together, it creates a net lift. Um, but then I thought about it. I'm like, that might not be what they're talking about because wing loading is also referred to as um, it's a lifting care pa uh, capacity versus the all-up weight to determine its um, ability to exceed minimums during performance maneuvers. Uh, and like, so oftentimes it's talked about cubic wing loading. Um, it's oftentimes shortened to do what's my wing loading. And that's a, a unitless uh, way to compare uh, airframes, regardless of size, to help to predetermine the capacities of the aircraft to uh, to, to do uh, maneuvers, right? To do flight mm -hmm. maneuvers. So there's kind of two ways to look at it. Like, are you looking at, like, how how, how loaded is that wing? And, and they're related. Um, but oftentimes wing loading is a shortening of the cubic wing loading that people are really looking for. And that's kind of a unitless comparison, regardless of size of how the aircraft will perform. Yeah. Low wing loading is, like, lighter stuff. High wing loading is more... Um, slow, cumbersome fighter jet stuff. Okay. okay. How do airfoils work at different speeds? Um, like how an undercambered airfoil works at high speed compared to a normal Clark Y, which I think you were getting into some of earlier with the mm -hmm. charts. I did. Um, those charts kind of are the graphical representation of essentially uh, the coefficient of drag. And that's basically... Coefficient lift and coefficient of drag formulas are very similar. They're dependent on um, the area of the wing and the flow of the fluid around it. Um, and the area is basically the head-on area of, of the wing at whatever angle, mm -hmm. right? So all the area that's facing the airflow. Um, so the lift of an, uh, we talked about the lift in the under camber, it's much higher. Um, it part, partly because of the pressure differential and the coend co effect. Um, consequently, because it has higher lift, uh, it's also uh, going to have oftentimes a higher drag because you're you're having a higher uh, impact on the area, uh, in, you know, impacted by the airflow. So if you have a straight Clark Y. Um, you're basically going to get less change in airflow, so you're going to get less. Um, you're going to get less lift, but you're also going to get less uh, parasitic drag and less less drag on the aircraft itself. It's not going to be as thick. Typically, do the same job. Okay. <clears throat> and last, uh, washout. Uh, oh, I, that's what it was. D D. Uh, so the coefficient of drag or, or the, the drag force in pounds is related to speed, area, and co the coefficient, right? And then the, the unit weight of, of uh, unit value of, of uh, air. So you can see it's V squared, much like coefficient of lift. So the faster you go, the more effect the drag will have. It's exponential increase. All right. You're still on the previous slide. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Now let's go back to Okay. Last okay. one. Last, Last one. one. How wing tip washout works and how a wing must be configured to achieve it. Uh, okay. Um, I'm going to read what I wrote and then I'll probably punt. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, 
Washout refers to the reduction of the airfoil's area uh, angle of attack uh, near the wingtips. So what this does is by decreasing um, by decreasing the area of angle of it, sorry, the angle of attack, as the plane reaches stall, the center will have a higher angle of attack than the wingtips, which means it will um, it will stall before the outside, which means you'll lose lift, but you won't lose lift at the tips of the plane. And tip stalls are what are dangerous. Right, and what happens if you did it the other way, if the tips, one wingtip loses uh, lift before the other, it basically rot rotates the craft over mm -hmm. and causes it to be even a worse condition. Uh, so not only does it lose lift, but it loses it differently and causes uh, a lack of control for a moment. Uh, on top of, if the airfoil at the wingtip where the control surfaces are lose lift, they also lose function. So those, those control surfaces at the tip don't have air flowing over top of it anymore. It's turbulent. So they, they oh, yeah. are ineffective. So not only do you not have, you have a plane that's rotating over, you have a loss of lift, you probably have a, a heavy nose over, but you also drop a wingtip. So, and then you can't fix that because, because you can't you no have, you have no flow control over your uh, control surface. Yeah, you have no flow over the, the surfaces. That's a bad situation. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a whole set of bad, right? That adds and another so, layer to how dangerous tip stalls are. Okay, now uh, I see why yeah. they're so bad. Yeah, why people freak out about it. I mean, yeah. and the RC aircraft, it's not huge. But if you're coming in for landing, that's when you're coming in at a high angle of attack, right? And you're going low. So your lift is just about where your weight is. That's kind of the whole point why you're coming down. Um, if you lose lift, if you stall... If you lose at the wingtips, you will not recover that aircraft. It will just tank. You won't be able to fix it. But if you lose it in the middle, you'll still be able to control it. And by the middle, you mean up along the fuselage? Yes, up along, yeah, near the center of the aircraft. Um, okay. So basically, by changing that angle of attack, you will still be below the stall angle of attack at the wingtips when the center, if it's the same airfoil and all that stuff, uh, is stalling out. That, so how do we, let's see, how do we configure it? You basically do a negative twist from center to exterior by mm -hmm. a couple degrees. Yeah. Either you cut out different airfoils and attach it to the, the same spar, or you twist it and glue it and <laughs> stick it there and wait until it dries. Or if you're working with a foam board, just give yourself an under-cambered wingtip. Uh, yeah, what a lot of people will do is they'll put a straight, um, they'll They'll put it down straight as they fold over the wing or set it up. And then they'll put like a couple books on the, the back uh, trailing edge of the last quarter of the airfoil uh, of the wing. So that portion will lift up just a little bit. And it changes the air, uh, angle of attack by a couple degrees. You'd have to show me that sometime. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I suppose. You can basically, like as you're putting your wing together... You put you put a book under the wingtip, the la the outside quarter of your wing. Okay, I think I might get it. And consequently, that lifts the whole back end up a little, which mm -hmm. rotates the wing just slightly. Okay. Uh, there's a Numavig has a flying wing, and in his flying wing video, he puts washout in it, and it's very clearly and concisely done. He think he's just like two layers of foam board as he's putting down his wing. Keep the trailing edge against the thing, and the, the back edge is lifted up slightly on that side, on the exterior tips. So, yeah, hope that helps. Okay. Well, Do we have any other questions? Or no, I, think that's I, it. I think that's it. At least that's all okay. we got in the uh, in slide deck. So. Okay. <sighs> we made it. Uh, for better or worse. All right. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see if it does anybody any good. All right. Well, I think what's most important about this one is hopefully this helped you, right? Hopefully this helped you understand lift. and didn't make it more confusing. If you have any further questions, you can reach out in our Discord. You can reach out in our emails, um, aviationrcnoob at gmail.com. You can reach me at matthew at aviationrcnoob.com or joe at joe at aviationrcnoob.com. Um, you can go to our website. We have a contact us, and it'll send it to both of us. 
Um, but yeah, re get into our Discord and ask those questions you have. And, you know, we'll see. There's a lot of people who know more than we do, uh, as well as a lot of people who are just enthusiastic and want to know the same thing and they'll help us all learn. Mm -hmm. So jump in and join us. And we'll include as many resources as we can down in the definitely the video description, uh, but also mm -hmm. the episode description as well, or the, the audio description. Uh, yep. Go look at some That's of that stuff. Do. We'll try to make it as clear as we can what each of the links are going to. Um, again, we're we're pulling from a lot of different areas and explaining it as best we understand and as best we can. But hopefully, uh, this has been beneficial. Um, mm -hmm. we'll yeah, see. Let us know what you, if you like this format too, please. Yeah, it's different for us. Um, let us know. And uh, we we may be able to do some more episodes like this where we've we can do some deeper dives and we've got visuals to be able to go along with them. Mm -hmm. um, or maybe this format doesn't work for us. We'll see. All right, we'll see. Um, like I said, look forward to it. Joe, you want to take us out? Yeah, I suppose so. Well, guys, as always, we thank you for tuning in and listening. We hope you have enjoyed listening uh as long as it's been goodness uh as much as we've enjoyed having the conversation uh if you have questions thoughts comments concerns uh reach out to us uh via email matthew brought that up earlier or you can join us in our discord server link in the doobly-doo thank you matthew coville um mm -hmm. and we have channels there for that um a final thank you to our patrons who continue to help keep the lights on and um keep the bills at bay Thank you very much. Great deal. Thank you. Um, and yeah, you kind of covered my spiel earlier. Join us for some upcoming build nights. And Matthew, if you got nothing else? I don't have anything else. Thank you, Joe. You did a good job. Thank you very much. We will see you guys next time. Bye. We did it. For better or worse.